Thursday, Smite fans, you are watching the SCC week number two. We're over here in EU to start off this week. North America tomorrow. My name is Dolson Gore. You and I are partners all day today. We're starting on the desk. We'll cast later, and then we'll round out the day on the desk after that. But we are starting in EU here, Gore, and uh, should be a lot of fun action. We've got some great matchups starting off Pandemonium versus Elysium. What a way to start off the day here over in EU. Clay Soldiers versus the Accounting Department after that. And then we will round out with just F6 versus the Snake Hunters. Gore, what a way to start off this week in competitive smite. Yeah, I'm actually really excited for this first one. I spent a lot of last week's first desk, specifically for Elysium, trying to make it sound like they weren't just going to gravitate towards the top because, uh, look, it's a team that has Trick Sank and adapting on it, right? They're going to gravitate towards the top. Mm -hmm. The question is how much further ahead, right? Are we talking Belt Slap literally undefeated, save for, like, a few games all of last year? Or are we talking about a team that is just eking out some of those wins? Right now, obviously, with only one week of play, it's not like they're by and far ahead, but I think this is a team that if they can continue to win in a fashion like they did last week, we're going to see them, you know, that 1-0 turn into a 2-0, turn into a 3-0, right. turn into a 4-0, right? And then as the weeks go by, one number just keeps on counting up larger. Yeah, depending on what happens uh, with the accounting department later on, could be a sole owner of first place of this uh, after this first matchup here today. we got some great North American matchups tomorrow, same time, 11 a.m. Eastern time, so make sure to tune in then as well. So, so Gore, I mean... I suppose that kind of tips your hand then a little bit. You look at Elysium versus Pandemonium. Does that mean you're leaning in the way of, of adapting and tricks tank in that squad in this what could be top of the table matchup? Yeah, I think it's just one of those things right now, again, when you look at the meta, you have to look at all these different little, I, I want to say like the variety that we're going to be looking at. Last week, we saw a lot of solo focus in both Europe mm -hmm. and North America, but I think the biggest thing that, that really caught my eye and still catching my eye and should still be catching everyone's eye is the fact that your junglers and your supports are still drastically important in the game, right? And well, right. your jungler and support are pro league level players. Like, I mean, you've got Adapting, who did it uh, longer than anybody else, and Trick Tank, who has been doing it just as long, maybe not quite at uh, the pro league level the entire time, but they've been playing for so long now that you have to be looking at this. And it, when you look at the jungle, Adapting really was able to just run free last week, didn't have a lot really hindering him. And I, I think it comes down to the fact that he's going to have something going for him that is just jungle variety. He can play damn near every assassin in the game, and even some that aren't actually assassins. This Al Kuang, yep. a very favorite pick. I think he picked that last week as well. It's just one of those things that it's so difficult to lock him down. And I think that's uh, what we're going to see the struggle with today. How do you deal with adapting? And how is it to, uh, I mean, how do you adapt to him? How do you actually right. stop him from <laughs> just doing what he wants? Well, it's so difficult, right? I mean, to your point there, Gore, you're playing the, these assassin get in, delete the enemy type of picks, the Al Kuang, the Kamazots that we just saw. Absolute damage facilitators. Hunbats obviously will do a good bit of damage as well, but that's more more team f fight facilitation in a pick like that. So I agree with all your points there. We, we've seen so much variety already in uh, in adapting picks that it's hard to lock down what direction he's going to go. Is he going to facilitate a team fight with a pick like a Hunbats, or is he just going to sit in the back line with an Al Kuang and uh, and shred your carries? Remains to be seen. I'm excited to watch what adapting. The pick up here today. Gore, the, the matchup in the jungle then becomes ever so important. If you're yep. looking at the opposite side, Sarpe, uh, for, for the opposing team here, is going to have to step up. Whenever you're going against adapting, the, the onus is on you as the opposing team jungler to bring your A game in a matchup like this. And I'm going to be honest, when I look at this lineup, Sarpe's name isn't really the first one that comes to mind. I mean, even watching last week's games, right, Kana was definitely a big factor in a lot of that. And, and I think Sarpe has a lot to give to this team, but like you said, this is where it becomes crucial for you, right? It, it's not just going to be can your solo laner out solo the other guy, because that's going to be difficult to do when you're going up against someone like Terrorum. And when you look at specifically last week's matchup for Elysium, Saragazek just struggled against adapting, and it felt like the jungle just wasn't able to do anything. That's a big 
goal for Sarpei here is to just not have that kind of performance, right? Do something that right. feels like you're in this game. Very quickly last week, it felt like the, the jungle matchup was outclassed here. I think if you can just hold your own for a little bit, go even pretty early on, not fall too far behind, you're going to be in a better spot transitioning into that mid to late game portion to help deal with adapting in those team fights. But that's yep. where the struggle really comes forward with. When you're looking at this Elysium squad, they want to kill you fast. They're going to get into your jungle. They're just going to play the meta and the map a little bit better than you. So you have to be, like, I, I would are you hyper aware of your mid laner of your solo laner right now because those two seem to be the ones where the jungles are hanging out a little bit more than everywhere else and, and make sure that you are following up adapting as quick as possible because if he starts getting and uh, to the point where he's out rotating you it might as well be over so sarpe has to be on point yeah terum versus kana gore out of that solo lane will be very fun to watch as well we've seen a lot of solo carry potential from the solo lane in the first couple of weeks here of the scc yeah. picks and bans for game one in this riveting matchup between Elysium and Pandemonium joining our screens now. And, and you have to imagine, Gore, with all the talk that we've put in Adapting's corner, th th there's got to be a little bit of focus on this guy out of the jungle, right? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we see some bans go his way, although... What, Set is the first assassin that comes to my yep. mind that has been a top ban? There haven't been as many assassin and specifically like jungle target bans. A lot of mid laners getting kind of thrown out there. I mean, we're seeing some come through now. I mean, Tiamat, I don't expect to get to actually see her play. I'm surprised. I couldn't remember when she would be available. But realistically, I don't think we're going to get to see her for a long time, right? It's the new God Syndrome. And I also wouldn't be surprised if you get the opportunity to have all five of your bands here for Pandemonium before we see something locked in for adapting. He likes to wait for that fourth, fifth pick. So he's probably going to be on the bottom right of your screen, right? Like he's going to take a or bottom left of your screen, opposite of where my camera is. That's where, you know, it's going to take a long time. He's just going to wait, see what he has to go up against. And so yep. it gives you time for Pandemonium to kind of play the field. And look at the, the bands here from Elysium focused towards Preds out of the support role. The Sobek Cerberus being taken away. Kana, of course, on the Sun Wukong. Uh, very threatening out of that solo lane. So I, I don't really disagree with any of the bands that we've seen up to this point here so far. Gore Guan Yu saw a rise in play towards the World Championships of Season 7. Apparently that has continued here. Guan Yu was banned out a, a little bit there in week number one, but makes his way through here in game number one between Elysium and Pandemonium. On the opposite side, though, Chernabog, Gore. Are we in a world where Chur Chernabog is worth the first overall pick? Now, I was actually a little surprised by it. Last week, there was a lot of Chernabog versus Apollo talk, and, and I still think in my mind that Apollo should come just a little bit ahead of him, right? I think that the passive that Apollo brings, just his survivability in general, is a little bit stronger than what Chernabog's going to be able to bring to the table. But the fact that Chernabog, without having to use any mana, can just kind of warp to the other side of the map is pretty nice, especially in combination with this Athena. If you put this Athena in the duo lane with him, that means Chernabog can drop ship into a team fight. Athena can come with him and or use that mitigation on her yep. ultimate to try and save somebody else. Or if this Athena is somewhere in like the solo lane or, you know, maybe even the jungle where we've seen it occasionally, then it's something that can rotate throughout the map. And if you're looking to out rotate adapting, a global ultimate's a pretty good way to do that. Agreed. Yeah, this, this global pressure is really king. I mean, we talk about specific gods and, and their metas rise at the end of season seven. All that, what's good here at the beginning of Season 8. The, the global presence has just continued to be of the utmost importance. Mm -hmm. It was Apollo there for a little while. Ratatoskr uh, was pretty important there in week number one. Chernabog and Athena, if you're going to pick anything to be able to rotate with an Apollo out of the duo lane, I, I suppose a Chernabog-Athena lane, if Athena ends up going support, uh, is a pretty good way to do so. Aphrodite makes her way through to round out Pandemonium's top three, and then Tsukiyomi and Apollo there on the other side. So assuming that's Tsukiyomi then, Gore, for adapting, do you like that pick with his play style? I do. I think that this is actually going to be pretty solid. And again, it's one of those things, if Guan Yu wasn't locked in, I'd say, well, technically you can flex to solo, right? But I think it's going to allow him to lock down to the back line. I mean, you look, you're trying to get back to Chernabog, Aphrodite. I actually think Sukuyomi, even though it wasn't, you know, Aphrodite wasn't locked in yet, he kind of had some clairvoyance there. He's going to have a good time getting back there, trying yep. to deal with it. I do think he's going to have to focus a little more on anti-heal early on, but those items are still pretty solid, so there's no real reason to, like, fret over that. The thing that interests me is the Odin ban, just because, like, I, you know, you get Aphrodite, you want to get rid yeah, of anything wow. that's going to have 100% anti-heal, but if I see Tsukiyomi Guan Yu 
I mean, you can stack another warrior on here, but with Apollo already on the board, that's four physical. You're already kind of leaning heavily into there. I think Elysium's a team that could make that work. But I'd be kind of surprised if they went that route as opposed to going for a, as maybe a Guardian. They banned the Cerberus, but somebody else that maybe has some good anti-heal potential. Bacchus at this point, I think, is actually the only one left since Sobek was banned sure. as well. Yeah, it's a good point. We'll keep our eyes peeled for, for Bacchus maybe <laughs> down the stretch here. Cool, Cohen. I like that pick for Kana, right? I mean, Kana... He has a couple bands focused his way from Elysium. Let's give him something that we've seen perform well out of that solo lane. And the Kukulin is absolutely that. Final two picks here for Elysium. The Siligor, 67% win rate, a 66.6 .6 repeating, I suppose. Won two out of three of her games here so far. Look at the draft that Elysium has built, though. Do you think this is a draft where Scylla will have the space to operate and have that ability to get off her damage. Absolutely. I think you've got, I mean, with between Guan Yu and Terra, enough space making. And this is one of those things, 80% of what Elysium have are top picks in their role, whether it's top one or two is really where the debate comes. But every single one of those, if you're asking, lock in a jungler right now, you're going to say Set or Tsukiyomi. You ask for a solo yep. laner, Guan Yu's going to be one of the first ones, Kukulun's going to be one of the second ones. Apollo or Chernabog, right? So Scylla or, I mean, what? I guess Morgan's up there right now? Like, there's not a lot that's right immediately behind Scylla in terms of mid player. So 80%, I think, for Elysium is just the the best that you could probably get in that role. And Trix Tanks is just a really good Terra player. Look, there's not much else to, yeah. <laughs> to read into that one. He's just really good at Terra. He likes Terra. And in my mindset here, this allows him to be aggressive but still bring some heals to the team. The Guan Yu plus Terra should be enough to really help keep even with that Aphrodite. Yep. Plus, it's a lot of control in the jungle. Similar to a Ymir, a good Terra wall is going to be able to set people up, either stun them or lock them into a fight. And yep. it's going to make things really interesting for Pandemonium to deal with. Pandemonium with that Cabracken want to lock Elysium into some fights here as well. Game number one, Elysium versus Pandemonium. Blazy Bard and Mifflin will take us in. Thank you, Dolson. How are we doing, ladies and gentlemen? We got, we got a bit of a treat here, really. These two teams, not uh, the, the classic headline matchup that you would expect to see, but Pandemonium definitely looking to take on the big guns coming into Elysium. How are you doing today, Mifflin? I'm doing pretty good, Blazy. Uh, I'm excited to be here casting with you yet again, week in and week out. And I'm excited for this match. I mean, anytime, I said it last week, I'll say it this week, anytime we're allowed to watch Elysium play it is just a treat. I gotta agree. These players, you know, I mean, how how many times can we say, you know, the these players are some of the best in their role? They've got two-time world champion adapting, you know, Tricks, tra Tricks Tank has been around forever. There's only so many times that you can really harp on about just how good this team is, especially with the uh, the way that we've seen them play over the last uh, couple of weeks during qualifiers and in last week as well in that first week of SCC. Kind of blew up my spot there, Blazy. I guess I won't talk about the two-time <laughs> adapting. I guess I can't talk about Tricks Tank now, so we're going to shift the focus over to Pandemonium, which I think in their own right has earned a bit of respect not only from the casters, but from the community as well. Guys like Preds and Joshi have been playing together at an incredibly high level for an incredibly long time, even streaked up to a certain extent, whereas Tricks Tank on the other side dropping down to about a quarter of his HP bar, but it looks like they're still willing to fight. Yeah, Trix Tank is more than fine. He's so confident on this Terra pickup here. The the healing that you get from that totem might not look like so much, but it really does start to stack when you stand in it forever. It does. A little skirmish on this left-hand side mid-camp. I expect to see uh, Elysium looking for the early pressure in mid almost the entirety of this game. Up against Aphrodite and this Athena, Tsukiyomi and Scylla are just going to hit their power spikes so much more quickly. For sure, and I mean, we can already see this healing on the left-hand side. Tricks already nearly back to full, pretty much. Is that just pretty much looking to, to be constantly aggressive here in this left lane? I almost feel like the duo, actually, hold that thought, Streak Up could be in some trouble. The dash forward from Tricks isn't quite going to find it. Spudio might get turned around on him. The beads are going to be popped, so he'll be just fine. What I was about to say, Mifflin, is that this duo lane is kind of a mirror match, pretty much, with Elysium just having the better version. I, I think that almost fundamentally makes it not a mirror match when one version's slightly better, but I see what you're saying. It's a similar play style from both of these teams, and 
So far, it's been similar outcomes as well. Both ADCs trade out their beads in that last skirmish, which is going to open up both teams to a duo side gank. Unfortunately, though, for Pandemonium, I don't think Athena Sarpe is really going to be looking towards this duo lane anytime soon, whereas adapting on the Tsukiyomi can come over just about whenever he wants. Yeah, it's the big disadvantage of trying to run this Athena in the jungle. She's got a lot that she can do, especially in the mid to late, but in that early game, she really will struggle. Trix Tank takes a little bit more poke from Preds, but Spudio's here, and I don't think Preds can really do much else. Yeah, I don't think that was even a good trade for Preds, but maybe I eat my own words here. Sarpe making an early rotation over here. If Elysium decides to contest this mid camp, their lives could very well be forfeit, but instead, the Athena could move in towards the purple, but it's going to be a gank. Going the long way around and is going to catch Trick Tank off guard with that blink play there. I don't think Spudio will fall down as well, but a first blood onto the support, definitely not a bad look, especially on a character like Terra. Yeah, you'd really want to get that uh, Athena up and rolling as quickly as possible as well. So first blood bounty going to be huge for him. And we even get to see a little bit of the discipline from Pandemonium. They know that Elysium's purple buff is up, but Joshi communicates very well that Angry and Adapting crossed over to that left side jungle, meaning that it would be an, an egregious overextension had they gone for that invade instead. They back up with their win and just take it cleanly. I really like seeing that from Pandemonium. And that's kind of what they have to be doing throughout this whole game, right? Elysium are not one to let you get away with things for free. They're going to take the, the little tiny victories and turn those into it. just the biggest thing. So Pandemonium really needs to keep up that discipline, keep taking those small wins and not letting Elysium have anything. And Pandemonium's drafted a good composition to play exactly around that, those small skirmishes. If at any point uh, a fight starts uh, on even footing for Elysium, uh, Sarpe could ult over, or Joshi could switch the tides with Undying Love, or back up and use those heals. Streak up as well with his global ultimate should be able to turn the tides of just about any battle in favor of Pandemonium. I really expect to see them try to utilize these globals in the early game, potentially have Pandemonium put some pressure over to the soul lane. You can have Streak up rotate over or even Sarpe as well, but I really don't want to see fights starting in the dual lane often. You don't want to have both your global ults stacked up on top of each other. You're going to lose out a lot of that value. Absolutely, and if they, uh, if Pandemonium do choose to fight, we'll, we'll continue with that example over in the solo lane. Actually, hold that thought. Kana might get some uh, unwanted visitors here. Joshi in the mid lane as well could be in some trouble. Gets rooted and stunned, forced to pop those beads. And back in the right hand side, Adapting could be in some trouble. Gets locked in the baby cage and he's taking a lot of damage. Two man stun's gonna be good, but the beads are gonna be even better from Connor Preds. Keeping those tremors down on the ground is gonna finally pick up that kill. So, hey, in a bit of trouble now. Terrorim charging forward. Cavalry charge up in the air, looking for the stun for Angry. Down falls the monster and Preds. It's going to fall prey to the crush. One for one trade over on the right hand side. An elongated battle around this blue buff results in an easy rotation for Angry there. Finding that kill onto the Scylla in the early game going to be very good for him, especially considering the build he's elected to go for with the Sands of Time in that first slot. He's going to have the additional MP5 to stick around in lane a lot longer, meaning that he should be able to farm up a lot more easily. And he's actually foregone the Rod of Tahuti in exchange for the Spear of Desolation in the early. It seems like Elysium are really trying to expedite their power spikes. It's smart play as well. They don't want to give Joshi an opportunity to get to that late stage, right? Aphrodite, super kind of weak in that early part of the game. And Scylla doesn't have the best early herself, but with that conduit gem that she's actually elected to not go into, the sense of time, instead getting picked up, I think that's another reason why we see Spirit Desolation being prioritized here instead. Yeah, just a little bit additional CDR. Angry wants to be throwing out those crushes left, right, and center. Doesn't ever even want to think about it. Just wants to have that cooldown available to him at all times. And honestly, I can understand that with Scylla, especially considering the recent buffs that she got with itemization changes as well. She doesn't necessarily need Conduit Gem like we might have once thought, especially considering how quickly you can get the Rod of Zahuti online and the Spear of Desolation. So I'm really starting to like these builds that have been uh, emerging from the European SCC, especially around the mid. They're almost all all of them, mid laners that is, have given up on the Conduit Gem and instead have shifted their focus towards the Sands of Time. And the Sundering Axe as well, but uh, I've uh, I've been a huge propo proponent? Is that the, the right word? I've been a yeah, huge fan it. 
of uh, the, uh, the Pendulum of Ages for a while now. And I'm really happy to see it start to get that pickup potential. Terrorim might be looking to get picked up himself up into the horse. He goes. Finds a nice little heal there in Trix Tank's arms. And now four members of Pandemonium are here looking to potentially find Trix Tank. Here comes Sharpe through the Defender of the Olympus. Up into the sky goes Trix Tank with that ultimate from Connor. And he's going to go down into the ground there. Quick pickup from Elysium. I'm a monster. Comes over the wall. Hits two. But the damage isn't quite there yet for Angry. Up against those two tanky characters. The Crush could put Connor into a dangerous spot here. Especially with Terran back. Connor could find himself a little bit by himself. The laser beams are going to come through. Nice Connor dancing, but the ultimate from Aphrodite is going to be on there. The healing is good, but not good enough. Joshi is able to find it. And Connor finally does fall down. I got a little bit confused there. I thought Connor went down earlier than he did, but he survived for so long. Terrorim should be able to get out just fine. Scratch that blinking forward is Sharpe. The damage is going to be good. Bada bim, bada boom. Down falls Terrorim, Sharpe, and... Joshi now in some trouble once again. It could be probably Sharpe gonna fall down here to the dash from Trix Tank. Now going forward is Angry, still fighting right now. Joshi's gonna get hit by the Sikkim. Trix Tank is gonna be right there to witness the death of Preds at the hands of Spudio. Yeah, Elysium pull that fight back from the brink by sheer power of will, essentially. Spadio makes a late rotation over off of his own global ultimate, and then from there, Pandemonium was just too deep in the enemy jungle. They didn't have a clear escape path, and it was so easy for them to chase out. Sarpe overextends himself with a blink forward for the double taunt, which didn't result in a much. But at the core of it, we can take a macro view and evaluate the strategies in place by both teams here. That's the second fight in a row that Pandemonium has forced on that solo hand side, having Sarpe use his ultimate, the defender of Olympus, to close gap. This time around, though, Streak Up didn't have the ultimate available to him, so there was no rotation from the Chernobog, which results in a turnaround for Elysium. It's, uh, it's a kind of scary concept, right? As soon as they force Streak Up's ultimate, Elysium really have a decent chance of turning these fights because Spudio and Streak Up have basically the same ult, right? But the difference being, Spudio takes a little bit longer to get there, but can dish out a massive amount of damage on landing, whereas Streak Up is going to be able to CC that whole team with the slow, but he's not going to have that much damage when he lands, just relying on those abilities. So you take away Streak Up, not only do you remove that slow, but also you give Spudio basically free reign to get that into the fight by himself. Agreed, and that's exactly why Elysium tries to drag out that fight as long as they did. You'd think the longer fight would favor Pandemonium as Trix Tank gets caught on the aggressive here, dropped down to about a quarter of his HP, but an easy disengage by Pandemonium. Not enough damage coming through from this Aphrodite to result in a kill, but certainly enough sustain to dissuade Elysium from looking for further engagements, losing out on 90% of Terra's HP bar, and already Joshi's mm -hmm. back up to full. Triggs had to pop the ult there as well. But speaking of sustain, this uh, Spirit Desolation that we've been theorizing here from Angry Mifflin actually turns out to be a Divine Ruin instead. Uh, I like that. Uh, you get rid of some of the healing coming through from Aphrodite. It is going to slow down the build from this Scylla a ton. You'd think that with Divine Ruin coming through here, you might want to look towards the Conduit gem, but seems like he's not locking for damage as he puts Sarpe into the dirt. Three abilities is all you need if you're able to hit them all. Damn, that, so, I almost feel bad for Sarpe there. He, he makes a decent play trying to go for that steal, actually, on the left-hand side. Spudio, once again, is going to make it to the sky just barely, unlike Sarpe. I, I kind of feel bad for Sarpe, though, still. Hey, man, he, he had it coming to him. He was inside of Elysium's side of the jungle. You got to come correct if you're going to go there. And unfortunately, Sarpe, not quite correct in his assumption of being safe. And he's going to be two levels down now in the enemy jungler. In exchange, Adapting has been playing a very farm-heavy role, whereas Sarpe has been trying to get involved in these fights early on. Falling down twice hasn't really mattered for Adapting, but on, for Sarpe, it's really resulted in this experience and gold deficit. I'd expect to see Elysium's jungler start to get a little bit more involved now. For sure, yeah. We, we, we kind of talked about at the start how uh, 
We were expecting to see more early game aggression from the Tsukiyomi than the Athena, but our pace kind of been everywhere. Meanwhile, Adapting's been mostly quiet, except for a few plays here or there. But now that he's level 11, he's got a couple items under his belt. Angry could be in some trouble. Trick Tank coming here for the turnaround. Sape sat in the Lord. crush. Lay on the ultimate from Josh. Beautiful patience there from Angry. Just not quite able to pay off in time. Adapting a little slow on the rotation. If Joshi doesn't find that stun there, that's a f free kill on a Sarpe yet again, who's getting a little bit overzealous on these engages. I want to see this Athena put some more emphasis on farming up the map, get that second relic online. Once we start to see beads come through for Sarpe, he can start to look for this aggressive playstyle. But as of yet, this man dashes forward, gets sickumed, gets crushed, and has to run away at 10% HP every single time. It's time to shift the focus. It's not working in the mid 3v3. It's also kind of a scary uh, component of his build. No tanky items here for Sarpe. That could change with this last uh, item here. Potentially the stuff of Mirrodin. Not quite tanky. Definitely cooldowns Preds in some trouble. going to get hit by that defender of Olympus. Sarpe is here to help him out. I'm a monster. Didn't really do too much damage. In the sky, though, is Streak Up and Apollo. They're both circling, and now Trix could be in trouble. He's gonna be the next one to fall down. Preds gonna trade his life out here as well. Sarpe on the run. Spadio dashing forward, looking for those auto attacks, and he's gonna find them. Sarpe takes a spill, and Connor takes the adapting, uh, takes down the adapting. Joshi as well, gonna take a spill. O'Connor gonna follow him to the grave, and that's a pretty easy two for four, potentially a fifth here. Streak Up. In some trouble, but the double dash should find him safe. Terrorim going high, though. Still looking for yeah, the rip. ADC. He's nice and tanky. There's no way Streak Up gets out of this. Man, uh, just another fight that gets turned around by the Apollo ultimate landing in. Finds the double dunk into the double knockup. And because of this early Ikavel pickup, Spudio is absolutely slamming with his auto attacks. On squishy targets doing upwards of 180 damage per auto. I mean, it, it, we're just not seeing the same level of pressure coming through from Streak Up, who elected to go for the Blood Forge. And what is likely going to be an executioner in this next slot. It's a much slower build. It needs a lot more time to come online, maybe. Streak Up was expecting a slower pace to this game, but look, we're 14 minutes in and we're looking at 18 kills, and I don't expect it to slow down anytime soon. Absolutely not. Why do you think this, uh, is there other than just this is going to be a slower paced game, I can go for a more late game build? Is there another reason why Blood Forge is the pickup here for Streak Up? He's not, it's not like he's gotten any kills to really take advantage of it. It could likely be due to the once these late game team fights start up, he wants to have that health shield to deal with Adapting's ultimate, or if he's able to just trade HP with Angry once he goes into his own, that could be the case. As a Guan Yu ultimate is able to force the defender of Olympus out of Sarpe here. Looks like they might be looking for a re-engage, but do they know that Trix Tank is hovering inside the jungle? Seems like they might be a little bit privy to it, playing safely our Pandemonium on this right hand side. There's no ward there, so they won't know whether or not he's gone unless they try and step forward. But luckily for them, Trix Tank gets bored. He's going to decide to make his way back over towards the mid lane. Scratch that. Elysium instead electing to go for this right side Scorpion. What a play. I like that a lot. Yeah, just clear out these early objectives. Elysium's been getting the better end of the last couple of team fights, so they can feel confident looking at these neutrals. They want the Pyromancer to spawn. They want Fire Giant up to create these POIs on the map and force Pandemonium to continually take fights. I mean, now's the time to do it if you're an Elysium fan. Now, Angry's two levels up on Joshi inside of the mid roll. We've got level leads and support. Jungle, solo, not a single lane doesn't have at least one level on their opposition for Elysium. It's definitely been going their way, and once Jeez. again, Trix Tank making the initiation. Preds eats one crush and takes so much damage thanks to that Earthen Fury as well. Trix Tank really helping boost his team's damage potential up there. Not that angry really needs it. Let's uh, let's have a look and see how much this next crush is gonna do from the Scylla as Josh loses half Pity. of his health bar in like two abilities. It's ridiculous, Terum. Up here by himself at the moment, but adapting and, sorry, Trix Tank and Terrorim's healing combined is going to basically negate pretty much everything Pandemonium can throw at them at this point. But what happens there? Elysium shows up in mid, essentially just throwing their weight around and says, Alright, look, we're going to take this mid tower 
and you're just gonna walk away. There was essentially zero defense from Pandemonium there. Now that that tier one mid tower is down, means that there's really nowhere for them to escape to. Pandemonium, that is, once subsequent Gold Furies get started up. Once this Pyromancer starts up, it's gonna be that much harder for them to look for a disengage if the fight starts to go south. And 5,000 gold down, I mean, it doesn't take a mathematician to say that Elysium's likely gonna have a pretty good advantage in this next team fight. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it's starting to look pretty rough for Pandemonium. That whole comp is kind of not like in focus, but definitely like in capable, right? Th this team definitely needs that mid to late stage to really come online. Athena needs those levels for her base damages. So does Kabraken, Chernobog, one of the latest game hunters you could possibly pink uh, th think of, and Afro definitely does not shine so well in these uh small engagements in the uh, early to mid game so they really have to start trying to find something to get themselves back into this game as fire giant is getting started up by elysium here there's no way pandemonium's in the know about it they've shown so much pressure elysium is on both the mid lane and the right hand side that pandemonium are likely expecting them to be hovering in the jungle looking for a pick that's why we don't even see them moving forward to defend the fire giant elysium should get it for free and they do, absolutely. Pandemonium not even halfway here in time. Connor, the only one charging forward, looking to find something. Actually, scratch that. The rest of the team is surging forward. Streak up his hit. Defender of Olympus comes down now, adapting up into the laser beams. He goes, trying to find the damage, and Spuddy is going to make it up into the sky. Joshi, however, in the meantime, taking so much damage, just like adapting. But which one of them is going to fall down first? It's going to be adapting to take the first spill. Fire Giant gets reduced off of his belt, but Joshi is going to be too far behind. Connor. Looks to try and find something. Now looking to get away from everyone else. He's regenerating a little bit of HP, but it doesn't matter when Angry's here under the ground. Hits him with a sickum and down falls. Kakulan Preds still a little bit in trouble. He's got the tank stabs, but can he get away from these two tanky characters? The Blink should find him safe. It doesn't look like the rest of these two players are really too concerned about getting him, especially when there are two tier two towers on the line. Surprised to see Adapting use the Piercing Moonlight to re-engage in that fight. I expected to see Elysium just immediately back up, especially considering Spudio spent the entirety of that team fight just split pushing, trying to push up some waves in mid, and then he starts to regroup with his team a little bit later on. Results in what could have been a, a pretty clean flight in favor of Elysium. Kind of like washing out a little bit of Pandemonium, at least able to strip Fire Giant away from Adapting. But at the end of the day, what's the end result of it? It's a 9,000 gold lead, Fire Giant on four members, and only two towers standing for Pandemonium between Elysium and the Birds. So it's going to be a, a tough defense from the Chaos team here. But it does simplify a lot once we do get to these base defense situations. Keep your eyes on Sarpe and Kana if you're a Pandemonium fan. It's going to be up to them to get these fights started on the right foot. Unfortunately, they are incredibly squishy at this point to the likes mm. of Spudio or even Angry. So if we see a dash forward from Sarpe, it needs to be at least a two, maybe three man taunt from to get value. And then Kana's got to find some sort of blink forward. Got to use that ultimate to disrupt the back line. If they're able to force Angry to back up even a little bit, that's one way to get the defense rolling. Yeah, I was about to touch on that same thing here. So Pei, definitely the classic good defense character, right? You get Athena, you get a nice big taunt, you get some big follow-up damage in these defenses, but Sape can't really make that play. He can't really start that aggression without just getting blown up. We might see something similar to that with Joshi here, who's in some trouble, gets dashed on with that cavalry charge, and he's already falling low. Two cursed arms getting popped to make sure he can't do any sort of healing. Adapting once again falls down, though, in the back line, trying to find this damage onto Streak Up, who might be just fine, but Trick Tank's still trying to find him. Stun isn't going to be on the mark, but Streak Up has that root for him. Connor could be in some trouble here as well. Angry surging forward has already found Preds and Sape. Looks like he could be the next one on the menu, but instead, Elysium get their eyes distracted by a pretty looking Oni Fury. Pandemonium puts up no defense around their most important piece. Joshi gets dove for free by Terum and Spudio. You have to have Streak up there to dissuade this Guan Yu from getting a free cavalry charge. You need this execution of this kin size finding their way home into the Guan Yu's chest. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen. So after a fully charged cavalry charge, after he fully channels it, he's still at 90% HP. Spudio lands and doesn't take any damage either. Someone needs to keep this Aphrodite alive because alone, she's just free eats. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And especially with the cursed Ankh coming out of Terra, you have 
Uh, let, let's count the anti heal. You got Brawler's Beat Stick, you've got yep. Divine Ruin, and that's, that's it, true. really. So there's not really like. You don't have 100% anti heal on the side of Elysium without this Unk. So it's not the. It's not the be all and end all getting hit by one of these things, right? It's not like just them being around you is going to reduce your healing to zero, but Joshi is going to be in a perpetually scary place, and Pandem only have two Guardians and a warrior with a lot of CC who can peel for him. They're just not. So here's the thing, Blazy, about anti-heal and how you don't really need it if you're 11,000 gold in the lead. Uh, you don't. Uh, you just have to damage to kill him. Uh, kill him through the healing. It doesn't matter that he's actually trying to keep himself alive because there's really not much that he can do on his own. Uh, for At this point, Pandemonium has to start playing a lot more defensively. Uh, very often in the SEC and the SPL, we'll see teams in this state try and group up from behind as five and see if they can catch someone straggling in the jungle. I'm not sure that Pandemonium has the capacity to kill uh, in a 5v2 cleanly, or even a 5v3, Elysium has that much of a lead in their favor. And it's just the nature mm. of Pandemonium's comp that's kind of coming back to bite them here. When you have a triple tank frontline composition, it means that you need to be starting the fights on your own terms. You need to be engaging the fight, setting up for your team, being that spearhead that never stops moving forward. Unfortunately, though, Pandemonium doesn't have that option. They don't even have a standard mage to help them on these base defenses. They're really still completely reliant on the combo of dash for taunt into back off or a stun from Gabracken into back off. That's their best piece. Yeah, for, for sure. There's just no real big selling point for these fights, really. You don't have that big boom that you can hit them with. And Joshi is certainly looking to get hit by a down. big boom. And that's going to be Spudio from the sky. Connor going to follow his mid laner into the grave right quickly. And Preds not going to be leaving them behind. Streak up as well makes four. Sape, the only man left standing here. He's all the way on the left hand side trying to deal with that tier two tower by himself. Blinking forward into the Phoenix is Trix Tank. This Phoenix should fall down. I'm not sure what Sape is doing. There's finally, he's hitting the B button, but can he defend the base against five members? Uh, no. I gotta be honest with you, Mifflin. I don't think that he can. He's already taking some damage. He's already dead. I don't even have to say anything. Down falls Sape. Down falls the Phoenix. Down falls the Titan. And Elysium take a quick, clean 24 minute win. Yeah, I wasn't expecting it to go that way at all, man. Pandemonium's draft was so good throughout the early. They were choosing fights in the right spots. But Elysium's veteranship, their tenure in the competitive scene of Smite, really starts to shine their way through. Pandemonium, the first three engagements of that game, go their way. They gank duo in the early, set themselves up for first blood, and then rotate over to solo and pick up a couple of picks uh, immediately there. And it just doesn't matter. They weren't able to separate mm. themselves to the extent that Elysium were. And then the second Elysium got the lead in their court, they started forcing Gold Fury fights, Pyromancer fights, Fire Giant at the 18 minute mark. It was just an unending assault of aggression and Pandemonium wasn't ready for it. It's like I said, Elysium, one of these teams that will take the smallest little uh, millimeter of breathing room that you will give them and they will turn it into a whole oxygen tank to burn up the entire game. So we'll be wow. having to see how they're going to adapt that into the next game. Pandemonium definitely have some changes to make, but we're going to have to wait a few minutes to see how they're going to apply that. Ladies and gents, stick around because after this break, game two. Hell yeah, we have the lo-fi.
the fire for the first five minutes of that game, and then Elysium kind of mopped the floor with them throughout the last 18 or so minutes. 23 minutes, game number one. Elysium comes out on top. Gore, I mean, this is solo, mid, ADC. Top, top, middle, bottom of the map, all, all in the way of Elysium here, and th these carries just took this game over. Yeah, dude, after hyping up Trick Tank and adapting, I'm actually really happy that <laughs> everyone else got to shine, because, like, that's what I think about this team. You have two really big names on here, but that shouldn't take away from everyone else. Like, Tarum has been around for a, a long time and being yeah. successful in the solo lane. But the same thing can be said for adapting and Spudio, or uh, not adapting, Angry and Spudio there. Angry uh, to the point where I, I said, if we have, you know, anything like a, a mid Exodus, like we kind of had in the jungle this year for the SBL, I wouldn't be surprised if Angry is one of those players, if he's willing to move, that gets called into the SBL. Like, I think Angry is up there with the, that level of play. And after what I saw out of Spudio, I think I'd give him the same endorsement. Right? This was just so clean from those three pillars, as you had said. <laughs> that it worked all around to the point where I think I said that it, while we were watching it, Spudio had a lot of great ults. And it's weird to say that, like, Apollo, a, a good ult for Apollo is you got into the fight and you didn't yeah, die at the end of it, right? <laughs> right? Having a great ult to me means that you got into a fight, you were able to help get a kill. Like, Spudio landed in the thick of things several times and got away with murder because of it. I think there were a couple, one kind of like that, one a little bit later, a couple minutes later, over towards the FG pit. And just every single time you watch these fights, I mean, what, adapting's like 1 in 5, 1 in 6, or something like that? These pillars really, really made the obstacles. There's the Spuddy old I was thinking of right there, landing right on target. I mean, it was just clean from them to really set these up. They took the term carry and, and showed what it meant. That's just brutal brutal for Joshi then out of the middle. I mean, 2, 5, and 4 on this Aphrodite. Not, not that that's standout bad, because literally everyone on Pandemonium had a tough KDA at the end of that one. But just time and time and time again, I feel like he was either Terrorum, Adapting, Trickstank, Spudio, hell, even Angry every once in a while, locking down this Aphrodite and just did not give any room to operate there. 7k damage, nearly lowest in the game. Preds, just a couple hundred behind. 5k healing, I mean, that's solid, but but when you have Trickstank and Terrorum able to match that number, it's uh, it's tough there in the mid lane yeah. for Joshi. Gore, what I saw out of this Guan Yu this game as well, we, we, we've mentioned Terrorum and the KDA and then what, what he brought to the fights, and that's absolutely worth mentioning. Guan Yu's just good, man. I don't know. We, yeah. we, we've known for a while. <laughs> that's just one of those games where you just cut the cavalry charge walks out of a, a Cabracken ult. Everyone's looking at him. It's no surprise, I think, at this point that, that we're constantly seeing this god this highly prioritized. Now, I'd have to redo the math on it, and, and if you see me looking over here, it's specifically because I'm pulling up Guan Yu's abilities, and it's because his ult it does something like 2,000 damage. Like, it does a lot of damage right. if you can hit all of those strikes, right? Like It's one of those things. He's got good healing. He's got prot shred. He's got inbuilt cooldown reduction if you can connect with his two. And then his ult will just kill you if he's able to lock you down long enough. So he is, like you said, he's just good. And that's why we've seen him banned a majority of last week. I expect a majority of the rest of this week we'll probably see him take the ban. I won't be surprised if that's one of the bans coming up soon. And next week, like when the SPL kicks off, I'm not going to be surprised if he's still sitting up there. I think this is a top ban, and if not, a first pick priority pretty much every game. Yeah, big damage. You get to ride around on a horse, CC immunity, you stun people. It's like the Bumba's hammer of ultimates, it feels like, there on Guan Yu. Picks and bans for game number two. Let's see what it has in store. It's the time to adapt, as the casters kind of put it there at the end of game one. Pandemonium, obviously are going to get that first pick over there for themselves. We were sort of interested, Gore, going into that game at least. You and I were talking to Finch a little bit while watching that game go on. We were kind of surprised that Athena fell so far down in that pick priority. It was jungle Athena here this game. But it looks like Elysium had figured out a way to kind of deal with that pick. So I kind of wonder where Athena might start to fall here in some of this priority for game two. I still think she's someone that's very heavy-handed in the end is absolutely going to get picked up. But it is that question, right? Like, they grab Guan Yu instead of the Athena. They have Chernabog Athena on the other side. But you could see that she's something that you can deal with. Now, maybe there's something to be said about a skill gap maybe somewhere in there, but yep. they were running the show off of that taunt early on. I think that showcases why Athena is incredibly solid early on in this game, period, if you're going to have her in the jungle, is the setup right. potential that she brings with you. And I'd be interested to see if she is the first pick here or if that ends up falling over towards Elysium. Ooh. I don't know where they prioritize it themselves. Well, it's very similar bands for Pandemonium here, Gore. 
Notice Elysium. We obviously now see where, where Guan Yu falls in the Elysium tier list because they were happy to first pick Guan Yu there in game one. <laughs> They're going to swap only the Guan Yu ban here for game two. So obviously Guan Yu falls somewhere towards the top. And Gore, we're finally going to get a look at Tiamat here in game two, Pandemonium versus Elysium. What are expectations? Honestly, I genuinely can't begin. Because like <laughs> the thing is, is much like I would argue in a similar vein as Persephone, Tiamat has a lot going on at any given time, right? So there's a lot to think about. And I think the higher level of play you get, the, the better Tiamats you are going to see, to the point where first pick, first ban is going to be up there like Persephone was last year. But then you, you know, again, I go and try it in my games, and I'm, I'm terrible at it, right? It's one of those things that right. I think the execution <laughs> is going to be the, the crucial point to it. And I'm interested to see what phase of the game she's strongest in, because I, from every game that I played against Tiamat, it always feels like it's a different portion of the game that I start struggling against her. So I want to see where in Pro League, if Elysium are going to struggle, where it is Whoa. with this Tiamat. And... Honestly, I really like this. If you're going to get something in a vacuum to test it, Sun Wukong potentially set beside her. Like, you're going to get two, like, A-tier, S-tier gods to go and flank this Tiamat. I really like seeing this because it'll give us a good idea of what to expect. Right. Right. I mean, we have all this data from our own time playing this pick, but Tiamat at, at these levels is really going to be fun to watch and interesting to watch how you want to play around this pick. Tiamat's Sun Wukong set. Top, talk about a top three here. For Pandemonium, I, mean, I think they've got exactly what they've wanted. Kana on the Sun Wukong, a pick that I am very excited about, needs to get something going against Terrorum here in game number two. Scylla was hovered by Pandemonium there for their first pick. Instead, it's going to fall down to Angry once more. And Gore, that, that Athena-Scylla combo just feels so good in these fights. You get a big taunt in, Scylla's going to be able to get her damage off onto a condensed group of targets pretty well. Yeah. And I'll admit, adapting Sukiyomi from last game left me wanting a little bit more, so luckily we are getting a little bit more, right? This is the chance to maybe do a reset. Honestly, this is a very frightening top three for either either team, and I yep. actually think that's great. I mean, look at the state of smite. Ten really good bands, versatile bands. Guan Yu, again, going back to those numbers I'd hearkened earlier, his ult does 1,845 damage plus 270% of your physical power whenever you are able to get all of your attacks off, so it makes sense to have him banned out, but when I look at the others that have taken the place, right, you ban him away, you're still left with so many good gods on board that we've gone eight picks in, and I don't think there's a single bad pick on the huh. table. Yeah, both teams kind of getting exactly what they want here. It sort of feels like interesting priority there. Chernabog not going, or, or is going, excuse me, over to Spudio. Elysium not going to give Apollo right back to the guy who dominated on Apollo in game number one instead of Apollo then falls over to Pandemonium. So interesting there, Gore. And notable that, like you said, not going, not giving it back, Elysium had the opportunity to scoop him up instead yep. of that Chernabog, but opt instead for the Chernabog. And I think it is, again, just global ultimates maybe a little bit faster in terms of the rotations. I'm excited to see what he can do paired with, at least at this point, potentially. Well, Whoa. I was going to say Athena, but no, it's looking like it's going to be a Kumba. That feels aggressive, but Apollo Ymir feels even more aggressive than that. Talk about throwing a wrench into the mix here towards the end. I mean... Pretty much expected through picks one through eight, and then Kumba and Ymir to round out the draft here. Yeah. Well, we saw one Kumba last week in EU SEC. We did not love it then. Do you think that this is the type of composition that he's in now where he might have a better showing? I don't even know if it's the type of composition that's good for Kumba as much as it is the type of player that's good for Kumba. Sure. Trix Tank personifies in my mind the way you need to play Kumba. Kumba, I personally love if you play him in things like uh, Assault, Arena, a uh, Clash, any of the uh, non-conquest game modes, because you just want to fight. You don't care about yep. the farm portion of it. You don't care about that. You're set up and you are fighting. And I think that's something that I really like because Trix Tank kind of just wants to fight, right? I think he's going to have a lot of good setup here. I think it's going to be interesting, again, with the dynamic between that and Athena and Ascilla, it's going to uh, provide a lot of opportunities for Angry to really just pop off on the Scylla pick, yep. get a lot of good crushes, easy sickums, really good I'm a Monsters. So I think there's a lot to be wary of if you're Pandemonium here. You've got Set, you've got Wukong, you've got Tiamat of all things, right? This is a game for you to win, but you have to be worried about the Elysium setup because that can really break your team fight right at the beginning. Plenty of lockdown for that Scylla, but is it enough? We will find out in game number two. 
Thanks, guys. We've got some interesting pickups here. Now, uh, clearly Elysium took a look at the Athena from last game. They were like, we're going to show you how that works. Adapting was like, Sukiyomi, let's run it back. Same with Angry Spudio taking the uh, the Chernobog as well. Mifflin, what do you think about these two teams here? Looking at Pandemonium, it's a pretty standard composition. You have the Global Ultimate coming out of Duo. You've got a pretty mid to late game slated Guardian. It's a standard smite. It's it's as standard as, as it could be. I mean, this composition could have come through legitimately in Season 1, just replaced Tiamat and Set with, uh, I don't know, Thor and Ra. But when you look at Elysium, I think you see a composition in which they have really said, all right, Angry, you're going to be the one to carry this. You're really going to be the one to set it up for our team. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I shouldn't see I'm a monster miss ever. Um, the, between mm. Confound from Athena, the Groggy Strike from Kumakarno, or the Epic Uppercut, even the Kusari Gama from Tsukiyomi, all fantastic setup tools to make sure that Angry is able to find space in these team fights, find his abilities making their way home. It's just so much fixation on Elysium's mid laner that he has to succeed. Got to agree with you here. Joshi, though, the biggest contender for Angry. What do you feel? How do you feel about the, uh, the Tiamat Scylla matchup here? I'm not too concerned with the individual matchup itself. I'm more concerned with how well are they going to be able to transition themselves into the late game? How are they going to play around these team fights? Because as far as mid goes, it's never a 1v1. It's always a 2v2 or, or a 3v3, but never less than the two because you don't often see mages actually 1v1 each other. But I think that Tiamat's going to bring a lot of versatility to the late game. If Joshi sets up his, his lizards on the right-hand side, and then we have Streak up on the left-hand side split pushing, that's two lanes that are going to be constantly having to deal with pressure. You can divide the attention of Elysium and then artificially manufacture fights where you have an advantage. So keep your eye on Joshi and how he decides to play the map. I think that is definitely one of the scariest things here for Elysium. They really have to get into that giblet management. They gotta make sure that they're sending somebody to permanently deal with that uh, summon from Joshi. It's one of Tiamat's biggest things at the moment. And to be fair, Elysium have some pretty decent options. Terrorim has a pretty easy time dealing with the giblets, you know, so does Spudio. Angry as well can deal with them, so... Late game, I think it's going to be less about how well they can uh, take them out of a lane and more so having to have someone be over in that lane. But adapting makes an early rotation over. Shades of game one, but in reverse. Preds uses the wall, but isn't able to separate himself. Kusari Gama is forced out here. The beads are used by adapting, but it only prolongs the inevitable. Preds falls down for first blood. Elysium off to a good start. It's, a, as you said, a complete mirror of game number one. Elysium take the early gank here on the left-hand side, pick up a free kill. But the difference will be, Mifflin, can Pandemonium do exactly what Elysium did last game? Well, they've got tools to do it. I mean, they've got the best-in-slot jungler inside of Sarpe. I mean, Tiamat has been hailed as one of the best gods in the game right now with the versatility and pressure as well as all the damage mitigation come late game. It's going to be so hard to shut down Joshi. They should just slow down the pace and play around their strengths. And Even with First Blood going the way of Elysium, it's only about 100 gold separating these two teams. And now Pandemonium looking for the return invade on the purple buff. We saw Elysium do it a little bit earlier. Trix Tank came and took the purple buff away. This time, though, Pandemonium not able to secure the steal. Elysium are able to pick that up for themselves, and they're not going to be hurting all that much from just losing the smalls. No, they aren't. Certainly feeling very good about that. Preds, in particular, is going to have to play very intelligently around the next couple of minutes. He needs to close up this gap with Trix Tank. And Ymir, that is one, two, even three levels behind, is a Ymir that is essentially useless, a sitting duck, especially against the abundance of CC that Elysium has. For sure, and the abundance of CC is once again looking to potentially roam to the left-hand side. Preds nearly steps over some Caltrops, but instead adapting an Angry, just looking for a little something in the jungle, don't find it, go for a little bit more farm here. Just like pretty much everyone else on the map. Mifflin, is there anything, uh, whilst we're just waiting for these teams to go back into their farming ways, is there anything in these builds that you uh, want to talk about? 
Builds are generally pretty standard across the board. I am interested to see that Joshi did elect to pick up the Conduit Gem instead of the Sands of Time, uh, especially considering how much fixation we've seen in the last couple weeks from Sands of Time, especially in European SCC. I think he may have benefited from that a little bit more so to make sure that he can constantly be splitting, uh, split pushing with his minions. Outside of that, though, the main thing I'm curious about is this Athena. When is Terram going to make his first rotation? Where are they going to put it? And what are they playing around? Is it going to be around this Gold Fury once it spawns? Is that going to be the POI that forces Athena out of their lane? Or is it going to be potentially just a team fight in mid? But I want to see Terram make rotations sooner rather than later. It's going to all depend on how quickly these two teams want to take that left side Scorpion. This is something that we've been seeing time and time again. Is that if there's any so much of, of a difference between the two teams. The team behind doesn't want to clear the Scorpion, and the team ahead doesn't really want to clear the Scorpion either, so it's all going to be on that timing. Elysium has shown that they do like taking the Scorpions a little earlier than most other teams in the league, so I think we should be uh, expecting to see it go down a little earlier, but we could be waiting. Well, with this slight lull, I guess I could hop up on my soapbox and talk about how the Greater Scorpion, how those value decisions are made. Very often, you really only have the opportunity to take down a Scorpion after you've already won an engagement, be it a skirmish in the jungle or maybe a, a team fight five on five. But you have to win out on a fight first because the Greater Scorpion is just that tanky. It's hard to deal with in the early game. But it's a value trade-off. If you clear out the Scorpion, that's all you're doing with that one team fight throughout the early. That's all the farm you're able to acquire for yourself. So very often, we see teams look for invades or potentially just clear out their own jungle, just trying to make sure that they're able to get something off these leads. Very often, clearing out the Scorpion is just not the best call. That's fair, but it does let you set up for the next objective, but I definitely understand why a lot of these teams would be hesitant to do it, because if you do go and clear out that Scorpion, right, and then you lose a team fight, then you're, that, that's the other team now gets to, to reap the rewards of your hard work of clearing out the, the Scorpion first. So I, I can definitely see why there's like a, a seesaw there. Yeah, it's, it's a very hard decision to make. If you if you take the Scorpion in an even state, had Elysium cleared it out off of, off of their first pick, that means that they're saying, all right, we're pretty confident we're going to win the next team fight as well pretty handily. So we're going to be able to sacrifice the early lead we get from this one as already Pandemonium moving deep in Elysium's side of the jungle. It's a complete reverse of the mentality we saw last time, but looks like Joshi got caught out. He's going to be able to find the jump away though, not quite enough damage, but here come the global rotations, Defender of the Olympus isn't oh, quite going to be on the mark, but Josh is getting hit by those laser beams, he's still tanky, those mi the mitigations going to keep him alive, but not quite for long enough, Adapting is going to get traded out though for the mid lane, and Trix Tank could be behind him, but supports and mid lane for junglers is the trade-off at the moment. These two teams just kind of happy with what's been had at the moment, and they decide to walk away. Adapting in trade for Joshi, what do you think? Well, you don't really want to lose out on Tsukiyomi throughout the early game, especially with the kills starting to land the way they have on the side of Pandemonium. An early kill for Streak Up is going to be huge for him. Kana, who's already been getting the better end of Soul Lane, picks up a kill himself. But shutting down a Tiamat can only ever feel good, right? They can only ever feel like you're prolonging the match, trying to force this Tiamat to a much later phase, slow down those power spikes, especially considering it looks like it is likely going to be a Sphere of Desolation in that first slot, meaning that Rod of Tzuhuti, one of the most expensive mage items of the game, is still on table for Joshi. Anytime he falls down, it's time he's not farming, and I think Elysium's perfectly fine with it. For sure, at least for now. But the Rod of Tzuhuti is still going to be a pretty big pickup for Joshi here. It'll give him 20% CDR, and it'll reduce the cooldown of that summon, which means he's going to be able to throw giblets down every single lane as often as he pretty much wants. And it's just going to be starting to create that annoyance across the map for Elysium. And on top of that, right, it allows... Uh, Connor and Streak up to rotate a little bit more freely without worrying about losing too much in a lane, right? If you put two waves of lizards on the right hand side, it is a good wall, but Trix Tank should be just fine. So he, he that's more than okay. But if you put like three la three waves of, of lizards in a lane, then someone's gonna have to be fine with rotating. 
someone would be. Pandemonium's putting so much pressure on this right-hand side. Look where they've constantly been positioned around these back camps and around speed buff Terror Rem now. Left isolated, had Preds been able to find a wall. Maybe that turns the fight around, but Trix Tank, second Deja first, same as the first, finds Shashi. Once again, Josh is going to make it up for now. Freeze to stop Defender of Olympus and Adapting gets the kill. Stop me if you've heard this one before. Nearly play for play up from the cloud comes Connor, but he can't save his jungler's life. Streak up is going to finally find a return kill. But Spudio is going to be the one to fall down. Adapting takes a spill as well. Apollo ends up with a double kill and Pandemonium managed to salvage that fight just about. They have, but Preds with a slight overstay might be caught out here. Good taunt Hello. is able to pull him back in. Angry, not oh. quite on the mark with Sikkum. That could be a big no joke way. if Sikkum goes in. You have to hit those, Angry. Preds is able to walk out for free. Angry drops a, a kill that he definitely should not have missed. Yeah, unfortunate there, but it's a hard skill shot to land. It's just a, a very thin dog you send out towards the enemy opposition there. But already we're starting to see a common thread throughout all of these team fights. Elysium putting so many of their ultimates, so many of their resources into Joshi on this Tiamat, who just goes into the four-legged stance and becomes the tankiest dude on the map. He's able to absorb so much of what Elysium is able to bring into these team fights, and that's how Pandemonium is able to turn it around. Sure, you've killed Joshi, but it costs you three, four ultimates, a couple relics, all your engage, and now you're left a sitting duck, and the rest of Pandemonium can work their way forward. Joshi is essentially a lightning rod for the aggression, and it's creating the space for Sarpe and Streak Up to do whatever they want. Once again, Trix Tank is going to get caught out by the wall. It's going to blink forward, though. The ultimate what? is going to land on Joshi. The damage oh, once again, not quite able to hit him. Finally, though, walks a little bit too close and is going to fall down there, but not before getting a kill himself. Trix Tank takes a spill alongside his solo laner. Meanwhile, Joshi, the only one left to trade out. Pandemonium still definitely getting the better of these Fights now up into the sky goes Chernobog landing back over towards this mid lane. Connor will be able to escape just fine, but Pandemonium are really looking stronger this game. They are, and it's the exact same story. Everything used to try and shut down Joshi. You pick up the kill, but now it lets the rest of Pandemonium do whatever they want. But I have to highlight it, Blazy. That was a clean, mechanical play. Trix Tank using the epic uppercut not only to set up the defender of Olympus perfectly, by the way. Frame one touching the ground, getting slammed by Athena Ultimate. But as well, it sets up the I'm a monster. And even throughout all of that, Joshi still survives. This man refuses to die. Just goes to show you how tanky Tiamat is. Any other mage would be dead by now. Or any other god would be dead by now if we wanted to directly quote it. Right, Pandemonium finally taking the time to clear out that left-hand side Scorpion 12 minutes into the game. Look forward to minute 13, ladies and gents, because we're going to start to see sparks fly as this Gold Fury spawns. Yeah, we expect to see Pandemonium be the aggressors around this Gold Fury. I mean, at this point... Keep trading out Joshi's life. Who cares, right? As long as he's able to absorb three ultimates before he dies. I mean, that's essentially value in of itself. We don't need Tiamat to be that damage center for the team. Sure, you could play it around that facet. You could try and be that aggressor for your squad. But if it's working, why change anything? Well, have him absorb the epic uppercut. Have him force Terum and Angry to use his ultimate every time. And that's the first time we've seen adapting, not forced into using the piercing moonlight to chase out Joshi as well. These fights are just not working out for Elysium. I think, if anything, it's time to target swap. Maybe ignore the Tiamat for a little bit. Focus on Sarpe or Streaka. At least until Angry gets that Rodder to Houthi online, right? When he's got a little bit more damage and can for sure guarantee that he can kill Joshi with the combo. I got to agree with you, Myth. They maybe should be looking potentially at streak up or even preds right i feel like preds would almost be easier to kill at this point in the game yeah especially considering the ability Alex to go for that gauntlet of thieves in the first mm -hmm. slot instead of something like heart or sovereignty gonna make it much slower for him to get his defense online as terrorum surrounded by two gonna be forced into using that global ultimate early that's a tough situation especially considering gold Fury's just spawned so elysium lose one of their best rotation tools He'll be just fine for now, though, but Elysium gonna have to play a little bit safer. Pandemonium definitely could look to force out that Gold Fury on the left-hand side of the map instead. Deciding to go for the Pyromancer in, uh, in, instead of the Gold Fury. I already said instead. 
twice. There we go. Sape just chewing yep. through that nice and easily. Gotta think about my word choice. Fifth one. Hey, it's all good. Uh, you know, words are only uh, an avenue to convey meaning, right? And I knew exactly what you were talking about there, Blazy, but it seems like Elysium, again, getting the worst end of these engagements. Tier 1 towers stripped away, Pyromancer stripped away as well. We're looking at about a 2, nearly 3,000 gold lead in favor of Pandemonium at the 15 minute mark, and that's still with Gold Tree left alive. I want to see the order side team force the envelope, force the issue, if you would, and make Elysium answer a hard question. Are they willing to defend on the POI? Are they willing to show up and take the 5-on-5 five five around this Gold Fury? And the longer they wait, the more time Elysium has to play catch-up. This team, we saw it last game. You give them an inch, they'll take a mile. So we really need to see Pandemonium start to take this lead, this small window that they have, and push it open and not let Elysium come back in. Here we see Preds trying to strip away these oracles. Buddyo steps up, he's going to meet a wall, but Beads and able to just about slip between that little crack in the wall there, he'll be just fine, but no cleanse available for the Hunter from Elysium for now. Streak Up has made his way over. They've dewarded, and now the Gold Fury has started up. And it is going to be Pandemonium taking that offensive positioning. Trick Tank, the only one forward, means he's the only target. Easy for Pandemonium to select if there's only one epic uppercut. Not quite on the mark. Sarpe picks up Angry in the back. Trix makes his way out. Dangerous situation for Elysium. Terrams, the next one on the list. I'll pay that Kingslayer is going to be so good to do the damage, but Joshi's finally going to find the damage onto Terram. There's the piercing moonlight. Adapting finally finds a trade out and streak up. Puts Buddyo into the ground. A three for one trade so far. Scratch that and make it four. Down falls Trick Tank as well in the mid lane. And now not only is Gold Fury looking like a tasty treat, but Pandemonium are going to pick up a tier two tower here as well. As they should, Shriek up taking it up for a moment there, adapting, the only one on the defense, no ultimate available, thought about it for a second, said, eh, maybe I don't walk into four people on my own, just gonna go ahead and back up to his own speed buff, but that's a huge gold swing in favor of the team that already had all of the wealth, now 5,000 gold in the lead, Gold Fury gonna fall expeditiously as well, Elysium are forced into a hard decision, do we want to show up and defend? They answer yes, and they're punished for it. I think at this point, Elysium just needs to get those levels, those items online, but Pandemonium have such a good comp to be ahead from that is there really a way that Elysium can come back into this, Mifflin? 100%. All right, look, I saw PK wait and drag out every single game at Worlds to the 60-minute mark off of just the intuition that Paul might be able to do something with this exact pick, this Scylla. And he didn't have the amount of setup that Angry does. Terror M on this Athena, that's setup. A tricks tank on this Kumbakarna epic uppercut into I'm a monster. She might not be able to kill Joshi, but it'll shut down Sarpe. It'll kill Streak Up. Even Kana doesn't really have enough defense to deal with that, not with this Bruiser build he's elected to go for himself. All Elysium needs to do is drag this game out just a little bit longer. And that I think can reflect in the, uh, the state of affairs if you have a look at the leaderboard here. Pretty much only a level behind for each of these players, which given the state of the game is pretty impressive. Shows you how well Elysium have been farming. Pandemonium here show up on the right hand side and they're looking for a tier good two, time. but a nice double taunt there from Terrorim is going to be good to set up something. Angry not quite on the mark with the I'm a monster just yet, having to use it to run away. Okana already finished up Terrorim and now the Ice Shards forcing away the rest of the team. Trix Tank sends one up into the sky and Spuddy on the rest of the team are on the retreat. Down falls the support. Three people left alive. No casualties on the side of Pandemonium and only the tier two to fall for the right. Look at that. Fire Giant certainly on the menu, but Pandemonium have their eyes set on more kills already. You can see the VGS spam in their positioning. Set up an ambush here. If Adapting steps forward to check on this objective, he's going to lose his life. Luckily, Elysium did have that afforded, so they knew that the Fire Giant hadn't been started up just yet. But they have to know that it's being started now, and it looks like defense is not going to be the decision Elysium makes again. 7,000 gold down, two members dead as well. Fire Giant is just going to go down for free. I kind of like this play here from Elysium. We were talking about it last game, but they have such a pretty good 
they, they have such a good defensive comp here, especially with Terra and Trix Tank on these Guardians, right? And unlike Sarpei's Athena last game, Terrorim has the tank stats he needs to be able to step into Pandemonium for any amount of time, right? Obviously, he's not going to survive for ages, but he's going to survive for long enough to get in there, do what he needs to do, maybe get a, maybe even get a second rotation of the Confound off to help set up for his team. So I'm interested to see how Elysium plays this defense. Yeah, it's got to be off the back of Terrorum's engage or potentially Trick's tank moving his way forward, setting up with the epic uppercut. But either way, whoever gets confounded, whoever gets epic uppercutted, if it's the same target, they have to die off that first rotation of abilities. It's essentially a timer that Terrorum's putting on the team fight. If confound goes down, you've got about six seconds to find a kill or Elysium is just going to lose out on the engagement themselves. And so far, Pandemonium have been playing around that confound incredibly well. It's Preds and Kana lining up that front line for this squad. Mm. Sure, you could taunt the Sun Wukong. My man's going to hop up into a cloud, go invisible, and heal up for the next 10 seconds while you just start to lick your wounds. Elysium are really struggling to confirm their damage. Spudio, in particular, has been essentially absent in these engagements. Not enough damage coming through from the Chernabog. Angry, even though he's been able to find a couple I'm a Monsters here and there, actually at the, nearly the top of the damage shards. Just not enough burst to shut down these mm. targets. Pandemonium are getting away with murder. You gotta see what happened on the right-hand side as well. The taunt came through and I'm a Monster was set up. But Angry just got routed from the engagement as soon as he went up into it. Really good from Pandemonium to recognize that you know, at that point, the target is, let's just kill Angry. He's kind of a sitting duck, and that's exactly what they do. And now Pandemonium have all three tier twos off of the map. They've got two lanes under pressure. Now we're just waiting for the pressure to break. And this is where really Tiamat is able to shine. Those minions make it so hard to stop the siege. Blink forward from Trick's tank finds the double mez, forces the ultimate or beads rather from Tiamat as well, and Preds falls in return. That's number one, but Trick's Tank has now just hit the floor. Sarpe trying to get out, but the Pacing Moonlight is going to chase him down. All members of Pandemonium save streak up are looking pretty dicey in terms of HP. Joshi as well has a little bit more to his name, but Pandemonium are forced away. One member down, nothing lost here by Elysium. No lives, no phoenixes, and that was number one on the good defense list. They got to do that maybe three or four times and then maybe they, have, they get a way back into this. Elysium plays that defense so intelligently. It's a desynced engage. Terrorim going forward first, forcing the beads out, and immediately once Pandemonium says, okay, look, Terrorim's confounds down, we can start to move forward. We see Trix Tank blink forward, mez out the two targets that have already used their beads, and Elysium makes a hard pivot in decision making. No longer are they chasing out Josh and instead take the free kill that you highlighted earlier onto Preds. He falls down so much more easily than this Tiamat at this point. Level 15, a fantastic target selection from Elysium and immediately forces Pandemonium to fall back. As you said though, they're not out of the water or the hot water just yet. Primal Fury goes the way of Pandemonium absolutely for free. That's fine for Elysium, right? They're not too worried about Primal Fury. If it was an Oni, maybe we see them sweating under the collar a little bit more, but that's more so gonna help Pandemonium come in for this second Fire Giant, which, I mean, stop me if I'm wrong, Mifflin, but that's gotta be the next POI here on the map. Yeah, it's gotta be. With Fire Giant wearing off of everyone in the next five seconds, Pandemonium losing the Siege in the 5v5 with a gold lead and Fire Giant on five, I don't imagine we see them start to group up anywhere besides this Fire Giant in the near future. But I don't expect Elysium to put up a defense there. They've seen now that fighting in the jungle hasn't really favored them. Instead, these fights inside of their Phoenix are really where this team composition can thrive. They might as well just wait it out, allow Pandemonium to have this Fire Giant. 23 minutes in, it's not even enhanced yet. I think Elysium mm -hmm. could just sit on their heels and bide their time. I mean, they just did it, right? They just repelled a uh, fire giant defense uh, siege away from their left Phoenix. So they're feeling pretty confident for now. As you said, it's not enhanced. They don't have too much more to worry about other than, oh no, they do more damage. And oh no, they have more regen. But they can deal with that for now, especially with that gold and experience lead starting to kind of close up. Mainly the experience at this point, but that gold lead is also going to start having less and less of an effect. Up until Pandemonium start really cranking out the rest of these. Actually, I'll eat those words because three members of Pandemonium already have their upgraded starter items, which is scary. 
So scary, the power spike that affords you. And take a peek at the mini-map, Blazy. Already Tiamat finding pressure in mid as well as burning down the fire giant. That's the threat that this mage is able to bring to the game. She's everywhere. Absolutely, and doesn't look like uh, Dampting is going to try and deal with those lizards. Terrorim Jeez. trying to ult away, but he doesn't make it in time. Down falls Athena and Pandemonium now have the space they need. It would be bad enough for Defender of Olympus to just be down for this next defense. But now Elysium have to try and defend their Phoenixes without their primary engager. This is going to be a rough defense for Elysium. But they do have tools to help them through it. Quadruple upgraded shell. Three beads still available on every ultimate off cooldown. Elysium is ready for this defense. Barring the fact that their Athena has fallen. And that was their most important engage tool. Pandemonium, 15 seconds on the clock. Now's the time to use it. Okana blinking in and so is Prez, but Trace Tank looking to zone out the backline for now. Takes a chunk of damage for his troubles and Sarpe could be in some trouble. Up into the sky goes the set, but the tower is already down. Terrorim has just respawned though. No casualties yet on the side of Elysium and Pandemonium recognize that the space is gone. The time has passed. Back away, Phoenix in tow will strip away this jungle and come back stronger. Yeah, might as well start to push up the rest of these lanes. We might see Pandemonium shift their focus to a 4-1 split. Maybe four on the left side. Have Sarpe play that solo role throughout mid. Trying to split up Elysium even further on these defenses. If they're able to take away any individual piece, I think Pandemonium have a surefire siege attempt at least. It's so execution dependent, Elysium's draft. If, if Terrorem is forced to defend as the solo, you lost your engage tool. If Trix Tank is forced to defend, that means that the follow-up off the CC burn won't be there if adapting is forced on the defense in the 1v1 you don't have the piercing moonlight to close gap and finish off these kills that pandemonium and getting away with at five ten percent hp every single piece of elysium's draft is needed if they want to win out in these engagements especially considering they're 14 nearly 15 000 mm -hmm. gold down it's a rough spot. I think the only chance they really have at sending someone to defend is Spudio, who can make that quick rotation, but even then, having to use that ultimate to go to an enemy is a very risky play in such a close quarters scenario. But here come the minions. Firewave pushing up right. Giblets pushing down mid. Pandemonium pushing up left. Elysium have to deal with pressure absolutely everywhere. Looks like Adapting and Trix Tank are the two set to deal with this mid-wave. Meanwhile, everyone else is looking for this left-hand Phoenix. And, well, I think at the moment Preds and Connor are just waiting for this wave to push in. There it is. Let's see what they're going to do with that pressure. So far, nothing. Pandemonium just biding their time. Adapting force back to base from that poke makes Trix tank rotate over slowly. Still has the blink available, could look for the Mez here. Terrorim able to walk his way out off the confound, and already the Phoenix down to about 70% HP. That's a slow push from Pandemonium, but a good defense from Elysium to elongate this battle. Both the tanks are already at half HP though, and Trix tank uh -oh. surging forward. He's looking for streak up once again, but he, the Aegis is going to be good. Now the two tanks are in some trouble. Terrorim up. The creek without a paddle dashes into Sharpay, and he's gonna eat up Athena for breakfast. That's one defender down once again. Olympus is left wide open in this left hand Phoenix. Should feel the wrath of Apollo's might. Down it falls, and Pandemonium still looking to play this cool and calm and collective. They know they have the pressure, they know they have the time. The mid Phoenix is probably the next target here, especially with Trick Tank in a bit of a bad situation. The freeze is gonna come through, the damage is gonna be there. Down he falls, and those beads are not gonna be good enough to save his life. The damage is coming through. Elysium aren't stepping up. They're too little, too late. Down falls the Titan and Pandemonium strike back. Two for one. one That's for one. a tough one, man. One to one. We're going to the three game. Third game of the set there, Blazy. But look, I think that if anything, Elysium realizes very early on in that game. Wait, did we just let set Apollo and Tiamat land on Tiamat. the enemy team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's not going to happen again. You're not going to let all three of those picks go through again and not going to single one for yourself. Elysium certainly going to identify that the picks or the bands need to change, potentially both. Absolutely. Last game, we said that changes had to be made on Pandemonium side. This game, I'm going to make the reverse statement and say that Elysium 
need to step it up if they want to claim this game three. But we're going to have to wait once again a couple minutes, ladies and gents. So stay where you are and grab some popcorn. Should be a good one. It's the all-important Game 2 bounce back for Pandemonium. And, Gore, I think we deserve a Game 3 in a matchup like this. And we have one here in just a few minutes. After we break down Game Number 2, though, I, I think we saw a little bit of the writing on the wall there in picks and bands when you let through an Apollo and a Tiamat and a Sep. The, uh, the odds, I think, tend to lean a little <laughs> bit towards the other team. And Pandemonium's thanking Elysium for letting those picks through. Look, half of my brain's still trying to figure out what genre music that bumper was, and the other half <laughs> is entirely taken up, like you said, by Streak Up, right? I mean, this guy, it's one of those things, when you watch this, you look at per Apollo's performance in Game 1 when Elysium had it. You look at Apollo's performance in Game 2 now that Pandemonium had it. And I wonder why both times we've seen Chernabog picked up above him, because so far, Apollo's right. just doing it a little bit better than everybody else. Streak Up had such a solid performance of this. Look at that, a 10.5 KDA. Guys, you're not supposed to hit double digits in pro level play or high level play at all, right? This is something that's not supposed to come through, but he just had such a phenomenal game. No one was able to lock him down. Uh, unfortunately for adapting, the Tsukiyomi once again didn't get off to a good start early on, and that really brought him kind of a suffering game as time con continued to progress for him. As much as I think Kumba had a home here, I don't know <laughs> that this was the game to really make it work. And, and at the end of the day, it's kind of weird. We had a, a Tiamat. Why are we not talking about Tiamat? Joshi played more setup this game than anything else. Tiamat had a lot of lockdown that Sarpe or, or Streak Up were able to deal or follow up on. Sent a lot of minions to help them out as well during those last Phoenix Sieges. You could see those Serpents running down the lane to help them out over there yep. in mid. And so Joshi, maybe not the flashiest of them all, Oof. two, three, and eight. But realistically, I think like a cornerstone setup for this team, following very much what you'd expect out of like a support player, right? I'm going to set you up so that Streak Up can go 7 0 and 7, Sarpe can go 4 2 and 10, and Kana can go 3 0 and 10. If it requires me to die, it's worth it for the team. 7 0 7 for Streak Up. Feels good. Thanks in large part to 
a lot of the setup that you you bring up there. Akana, fantastic game on the Sun Wukong. Exactly, I think, what he needed to kind of get back into the swing of the set. Weird kind of flip-flop. This was a game where adapting actually did pretty decent, all things considered. 4-2-4, kind of middle of the road as far as damage goes, but positive in the KDA department. So the rest of Elysium falling a bit by the wayside here. Gore, some interesting trends, though, and I imagine we'll see some of the dust settle in picks and bans for Game 3. But we're now seeing, to your point, Chernabog prioritized over Apollo a couple of times. Yeah. We've now seen Kumbakarna picked up a couple of times in the EU SEC at least, and it hasn't looked good here. So I, I suppose some of this, Gore, is early season, still kind of figuring out what should be prioritized where, little things like that. But yeah. I would be surprised, admittedly, if we saw Apollo underneath a, a Chernabog pick here in this, this round of the draft. I mean, it's one of those times, again, you're – second weekend, right? Nothing's been set in stone. You're messing around a little bit, having fun with it. Figure out what works simultaneously for you as well as what works in this meta. 90% of the time a meta is determined by one guy popped off on something two, three times in a row and now everyone's just trying to make that one work, right? And so it, it all of a sudden will jump to the top. Yep. We'll see if that ends up being the case with any of these picks. Uh, picks and bans for game three. Third and final game of our first set of the day here in the EUSCC. We, we've seen the, these first picks be ever so important, Gore, in picks and bans. So I imagine whichever team it is that gets to lock in that first pick here is going to be uh, grateful for it. Because this time it's Elysium. So, so my mind immediately goes towards that Guan Yu pick here. I like the set ban. But remember, Elysium kept their bans the exact same from game one to game two in the first three at least. Except they, uh, they plugged in a Guan Yu when they were not able to pick him up first overall. So... Yeah. Wonder then if maybe Pandemoni Pandemonium feel like they need to ban out that Guan Yu because Elysium obviously highly prioritize it. Or maybe Elysium feel the pressure to take it away. But I already like the adaptation. Let's take the Athena away. We gave that to Pandemonium in game one. Set. Had a great game against us here in game two. Yep. And Tiamat off the table as well. So I think both teams making the necessary adjustments. And honestly, if Pandemonium don't ban out Guan Yu here, I'm curious as to what they would, would really think takes precedent over that. He was such a big factor in game number one. I'm actually surprised to see this. I think uh, adapting, it's not surprising to see him go away from the Tsukiyomi, but after those games, uh, again, set Tsukiyomi are kind of the two I talked about. I think it was in game number one, Picks and Bands, where I said, those are going to be your top two that you're maybe fighting for in the yep. jungle. And so far, two games in a row, it just has not been good for adapting. There's no other way to paint that one. It's just not been able to do anything for his team. Right. And so you have to move away from that. I think it's impressive, though, that they even choose to ban it away from Pandemonium, especially because it's not going to hurt them, right? They get to ban that away. Now Pandemonium are down two junglers, maybe three, if you go back and watch that Athena jungle, and you still get your Guan Yu. That's right. Elysium are feeling good. We wondered if Guan Yu would still fall into that first pick slot. Turns out he does. Sun Wukong in there as well. So, Gore, if these are... They end up being both of the solo laners for both of these teams. Talk about a heavyweight matchup. Kana on the Sun Wukong, fantastic in game two. Guan Yu there for Elysium in game number one for Terum. Looked absolutely fantastic. Yeah. So I think a lot of weight on both solo laners now to perform on what have become their signature picks here in this set. And again, this time without kind of ham-fisting it in like I did during uh, picks and bands number two here. It really is a lot of damage. Look, you go to Cavalry Charge. I'm just going to read you some of the things that Guan Yu can do. First off, his passive, that's just sick. I'm not even going to get into it because there's a lot to think about there. But you get in-combat healing that's going to get boosted based on his passive. You get cooldown reduction as well as a slow that comes from his two if you're able to connect on it. You get protection shred on his three. And then his ult does... 1,845 damage plus 270% of your physical power if you hit the same target over and over again. So if you are able to lock people down the way that we saw Terum do in game number Ouch. one, the way we've seen Guan Yu do, that's a lot of damage. If you look at your health bar as a mid laner or a carry, guess what? <laughs> you don't have enough that you can take that full ult. So I think this is a really good swing for Terum to be able to scoop that one up. Agreed. Sounds all good, Gore. Top to bottom. All that sounds fantastic to me. I'd like him on my team, and Elysium seem to agree here. It is an Apollo picked up over the Chernabog this time, so the first time we've seen that so far this set, Pandemonium, we're going to get the Apollo, that ever-important pick, over for their team. We've highlighted the Apollo player in back-to-back -back games. We'll see if we're doing it three times in a row if Pandemonium are able to take the win here. Second wave of bands starting to roll through. Ymir apparently potent enough for Elysium to want to take off yeah. the board. 
There's an Erlong Shen taken away as well, and then a couple support bands over on the other side. Pandemonium are going to take away the Emoja and the Terra. That leaves open the Nemesis score. Decent jungle pick for this Pandemonium squad. And I like this. First off, Cthulhu's still on the table, so somebody that could potentially get locked in, although we haven't seen him at the top as much as normal. But I think when you look at it, Morgan, you're going to transform into usually one of the frontliners, and in this case it'd be a second Guan Yu. That's a lot. Again, all those things I just highlighted, now multiply it by two. It's pretty threatening, but not yep. quite as threatening if Nemesis is there to, to help burn you down. The thing that's interesting to me is we've seen a lot, you know, like Ymir being banned, we've seen a lot uh, of Kabraken as well picked up at least these last couple of weeks, and it feels like the modifying of the map is definitely something teams are a little more willing to play with. Not going to see any of that here, but knowing that you have, again, global ultimates that are going to be able to come around this time, kind of limiting it down to what we've seen, but Apollo and Chernabog being able to rotate out of that long lane where we haven't yep. seen as much action, most most of it's been on the solo side of the map, means that I still expect a lot of fights pretty much throughout the entirety of this game. And look at what they give Adapting Gord Elysium do, the Kamazots here. We, we talked a lot in pregame about the different types of picks that Adapting can play. It's been a lot of the Assassin-y, let's try to get some solo kills in the backline types of picks here today. Staying away from the Hunbats, the Thor, those big playmaking setup type gods. What do we think yeah. about the Kamazots here for Adapting in Game 3? I go back to the beginning of the day and won our highlight reel when we're talking about adapting. I think I saw more Kamazots in there than pretty much anything else. I think this is something he's been playing a lot this year. Again, if I'm looking at Elysium right now, I just see survivability. Uh, you know, ignoring all Good the point. damage, ignoring anything else, I just see a team that is going to live a little bit longer than you. And that's going to be something that if you're Scylla here, if you're Apollo here, you have to step up and have an even more stellar game than you did the last time around, right? You have to be that next level player to make sure that they don't just out-sustain you. Well, Kepri for Pandemonium provides a little sustain there as well. Game number three, Elysium Pandemonium starts right now. A bunch of interesting pickups here that I don't think I really would have expected coming into it from these two teams here, Mifflin. Can we talk about Kuzenbo Tricks Tank for a second? Uh, sure, we could talk about Kuzumbo Trix Tank. I, I, I love talking about Trix Tank in any capacity. I think that this is a god that really fits Trix's playstyle. We saw him playing it last season consistently throughout the year. He wants to be in your face. He wants to be dealing damage. He wants to be the first one in and the last one out, and generally in a body bag if he's ever losing an engagement, or leaving one, rather. But it's going to be incredibly strong, in particular, into Joshi on this Scylla. If Trick's Tank is just stacks up with one of his squishy targets, if he just stands near the crush, he's going to be reflecting such a ridiculous amount of damage at this point that it might even dissuade Joshi from going for these, these large multi-man crushes or these, these more confirmed ultimates. He's got to really play intelligently around Elysium support. It's going to be scary for him, for sure. And it's going to be even scarier, I think, for Pandemonium. Kepri has a bit of an interesting relationship with Kuzenbo when he has such short cooldown. Scratch that for a sec. Angry in a bit of trouble. Blink forward from the jungler. Isn't going to find anything there. Sharpe just getting a little bit of damage off. Yeah, it was a little bit of a panic beads coming through from Angry there. There was no hard CC to lock him down. The Vampiric Bath doesn't make its way home either. Uh, essentially, just no reason for it to happen. Now Angry isolated. Whoa. Good crush. Burning quickly. Locked in the corner. But Josh, he might have traded out his own life. Sarpe, no jazz is just available. A level down. Adapting might be able to pick up one more. Unfortunately, no cooldowns available to hit uh. that uh, hourglass. Oof. It's a minions with the bat as well. Sarpe should be just fine to walk out of here. Decent one for one trade, but definitely favoring Joshi there, picking up that first blood. Sure is. Already has the boots too picked up for himself. Joshi seems to be going for that divine ruin again. He did it in game two, even though there wasn't nearly as much healing. So I'm not going to make the prediction and say he's going for that Sphere of Desolation like we're so used <laughs> to seeing. And instead, going to hedge my bets and see that uh, history repeats itself. I'm going to say this time around, just because you didn't say it's going to be uh, Spirit Desolation, it's going to be Spirit Desolation. I mean, look at, if you look at Elysium's comp, you know, other than Terrorim and Adapting, what, like, there's not, like, a huge amount of healing to be using that Divine Ruin on, so, I mean, who knows? Oh, uh, you know, you got the passive uh, from Sentinel Wings, from Trix Tank, you got the Spadio's Lifesteal, just, just wait, Blazy, you'll, you'll see. <laughs> Okay, all right, well, uh, 
I'll look forward to uh, to seeing what happens there. Trick Tank just throwing his way around here on the left hand side. Preds not really standing for it. He's just gonna look disapprovingly at the turtle monster here and uh, get hit by a small child, apparently. He will be, but Trix Tank doing what he does best, and that's a being aggressive. Just trying his best to be annoying around this purple buff. Doesn't really have the potential to steal it away. So beautiful. Such a good confirmation tool at this point in the game. Trix Tank just trying to put any sort of pressure on that he can. He allows his uh, ADC, Spudio, to solo farm the purple himself as well, which should put him slightly ahead as angry, getting aggressed on again. Once again, this is a really good strategy. Josh is pandemonium, but it doesn't pay off. Joshi is now the one getting aggressed onto Shop Subhay. Also could be in some trouble, but bat out of hell up into the sky goes adapting. And the trade goes not the way that you would expect. Meanwhile, in the left lane, meanwhile, in the right lane, once again, Angry does finally take a spill. Steps a little bit too close up to Subhay there. I suppose. I wonder if we can get a, a quick little peek at what happened there. Man, I, I'm worried about Angry. Already being 0-2 on the Morgan, one of the more execution-centric mages in the game. You need your Morgan players to be performing well on the field, and Angry stepping too far forward after adapting already bails him out of a situation like that just to lose his life has got to be a tilting situation. This Morgan mm -hmm. needs to play more safely. It's one of the things, right? Morrigan doesn't really have a lot of escape options outside of using the stealth really, really well or just ulting into somebody who does. But Angry only just hits five, so he does at least have that option available to him now. Either escape or go for the turn and burn, especially if adapt things around the corner. You gotta, you gotta remember how dangerous those double bats can be. Yeah, it's so much damage and survivability. The bat out of hell for both of them means that they can remove themselves from the play field while simultaneously dealing damage to the enemy team here. But even with it, Angry trades out his ultimate, wasn't quite able to get out of that situation alive, falls down easily, adapting. Just now, making his way back to base for the first time this game, uh, considering he went for Eye of the Jungle, the fact that he's been able to sustain out there for the last five minutes absolutely ridiculous. Picks up two kills for himself as well. Ninja Tabai and already starting to move his way into the tier two on Transcendence. This Kamazot is hitting an insane pace. It's the beauty of the bat. He's got so much in his kit that he can almost justify going for nice the eye of the jungle. That was a really nice shot. Yeah, Trix Tank is really good at hitting those ricochets with the uh, the Nene Kappa. But um, well, what, what was I going to say there? You, you threw me off, Mifflin. How could you? Uh, I think Trix Tank threw you off with uh, his display of mechanical mastery <laughs> there. And he, this is what he's been doing all game. Five minutes, Trix Tank has been standing in the face of his enemies. And I don't think he's going to stop, even now, pulling Sarpei forward. He's taking a lot of damage, is uh, Sarpei already. But there's the revive. The rest of the team have to just ignore him for now. But Trix Tank is left all alone with the Nemesis. Dash is already down. He's going to get slapped in the face by a small turtle. And down will fall the jungler, Sarpei takes his first spill of the game. The unsung hero of that engagement is adapting. He zones off the two members, Joshi and Preds, actually diving into the tower, just making sure that no one was able to move forward and back up Sarpei in that isolated fight. Angry force used the bat out of hell defensively, but it's just fine because a king adapting was able to do it all for his squad there. I'm pretty sure it's King Trix Tank, actually, if I'm, uh, if I'm to believe the names in the map at the moment, uh, Mifflin. I, I hate to correct you, but I'm pretty sure Trix is the only one with the title at the moment. Angry once again in some danger, but he's finally able to use that stealth effectively and gets his way out. Yeah, I need to see Angry just go into power farm mode, and this is exactly what he's doing, backing up to these back camps, going to farm with the red as well. He needs to be focused on staying afloat. He's been the recipient of all the aggression from Pandemonium, the only one on his team to have fallen at this point twice already at the seven-minute mark. As long as he's playing safe and slow, there are games where you can admit to yourself, all right, I don't need to be the hyper carry. My squad's doing well. Adapting's already 2-0. Trix picks up one. Spudio picks up one. All we need from Angry is to slow down. Three people on the right hand side here. Terrorim looking to get that damage off. And well, I'll uh, I'll correct myself when I'm wrong. King adapting. Didn't notice it before. Comes in with the kill. Sarpe takes another spill. And now Elysium looking like they want to be the ones invading this time around. Trickstank not quite here in time. Connor 
will be able to secure his own blue and walk away just fine. Meanwhile, Trix is just stealing a back camp. Yeah, Trix can essentially do no wrong at this point. I'm not sure anyone is able to pick him off. It would take a concentrated effort of Pred, Sarpe, and Joshi if they want to shut down this Kuzumbo. And we need Sarpe to have the ultimate to strip away defense already. We're starting to see Trix tank moving throughout these levels a little bit too quickly, having a little bit too much freedom on the map. Keep your eyes on Kana. Keep your eyes on Streak Up because that's where we're going to start to see these paces change. Once this Sun Wukong is able to rotate out, or Streak Up makes an ultimate rotation over to that solo hand side if Elysium maintains keeping pressure up over there, that could be one way back in for Pandemonium. But as of yet, we're still looking at a very even game as far as gold and experience are concerned. Even Pandemonium actually about 100 gold in the lead. It's uh, surprising to, to say that, right, given the, the pace that Elysium have set, and they are definitely the pace setters in this game, but Pandemonium really farming up well, making sure that just because Elysium have the kill lead doesn't mean that they necessarily have that gold and XP advantage as well. Adapting, surging forward once again. Oh my god, Jesus. Preds eats all of his HP nearly. All of it. Half of his HP in real terms, but Preds now hits that ultimate on himself, gets the revive, I'm a monster, nearly takes the life of Terran, but he's gonna be fine for now, Preds eats the dirt, courtesy of Angry, but Sarpe finally gets the return kill, adapting, takes a spill, and O'Connor, well, I was about to say could be next, but that was just the clone, he's fine, sacrificing himself for his master, Sarpe, double dashing forward, Trick Tank takes a L from himself, now up in the sky is Streak Up, doesn't quite have the mana to land in on Angry here, but three kills stronger are Pandemonium, and now that gold lead is looking even fiercer. Yeah, no rotation from either ADC there. Streak up goes in the air. Spudio uses his own ultimate as well, but neither one willing to make the commitment to go into that engagement. We need to see more from Angry, man. This is the third game now where he's been really not a factor throughout the early. He doesn't find any stun there. He wasn't able to peel out for Trick's tank. The damage output has largely been lacking, but there is a silver lining. This Morgan has now closed the gap in experience with the Scylla. Joshi is now equal levels both coming around that level 10 slot and they're both starting to rapidly approach some power spikes. Joshi does pick up that Divine Ruin in the first slot, whereas Angry is elected to go for that Doom Orb tree. Going to have a ton of power and movement speed coming his way. Keep your eyes on this Morgan. Once he's level 12, we really want to see Angry making these aggressive plays, likely turning into adapting. Going to be able to make those rotations a lot quicker than Joshi as well. Doesn't necessarily have the movement ability that Joshi does to get over those walls, but Zoom Orb really will allow Angry to get to those side lanes on a dime. We'll have to see how he makes use of that. Just put back to base, did the mid laner, and he's going to return. I did just notice that the Divine Ruin was picked up by Joshi, though, so you were right. Yeah, well, you know, you know. Uh... Look, Divine Rune it just works. It's just been working. It's a cheap item. You hit your spike a little bit more quickly than you would have had you gone for Desolation or Tahuti. Really, the only sacrifice Josh has been making by this concession is that he's slowing down his power spikes a little bit. The mid game is going to be a lot weaker, but I think his late game mm -hmm. doesn't really suffer too much. He still has been going into the Rod of Tahuti. He still picks up the Spear of Desolation in that fourth slot if memory serves. As of now, it just makes him get into that power spike a little bit more quickly but doesn't spike nearly as high. Well, so I think it almost kind of is more effective having that anti-heal against uh, players like Terrorim and Adapting, who aren't necessarily getting as much healing as they would in the late game. But because there is less healing in general, right, the flat numbers aren't there, the anti-heal is almost more effective at reducing that heal. Agreed. And now it looks like he is going to be moving into that Spear of Desolation in the third slot instead of the Rata Tahuti that we've seen from him in the last two games. A little adaptation from Pandemonium's mid laner, Joshi. But as of yet, both teams have been able to have not been able to break this stalemate, have not been able to break the even neutral of the map. Both teams looking for just that first opportunity to turn these fights around. And as of right now, Elysium's got a slight advantage. The four man grouping's a lot tighter than Pandemonium split up. But now blinking forward is Prez, gets the hug off onto Adapting, and Divine Judgment is going to come through onto him, but he's going to fly away, he'll be just fine. Whoa, deja vu, have we been in this place before? Another bat flying away from another chunk of damage, that's going to be angry flying through the sky. Terrorim nearly meets his end at the end of Streak Up, but the ult won't quite finish landing. 
that three able to stop him from getting knocked up. So Terrium will be just fine. This mid tier on tower, though, could be in some danger. I don't think Trix Tank is really in a good place to defend this. Angry certainly isn't feeling confident enough to step up to it when the combined powers of Joshi and Streakup is going to fall down. Pandemonium strip away the mid tower as well as the entire right side jungle. Both back camps able to be going the way of the chaos team here. Instead of going for that blue buff, looks like they tried to pressure out that lane, but Terram was able to rotate back in through his teleport and keep that tower alive just a little bit longer. But it's a struggle for the Guan Yu. Two levels down now on Kana mm -hmm. on the Sun Wukong. Pandemonium have taken complete control of the map. 2,000 gold separating these two teams. Expect to see the chaos team start to force some engagements, likely around this gold fury after they clear out that scorpion. For sure, last game we saw the Scorpion go down around about this time and Pandemonium had a similarly sized lead. So don't be too surprised to see that happen relatively shortly. But until then, I think Pandemonium are just kind of vibing at the moment. They just want to keep up this farm game that they've been doing so well at for this entire set pretty much. Other than maybe game one where Elysium had the farm advantage are able to steal away both of the right-hand camps, our Elysium, so Pandemonium, they're still losing the small objectives, question mark, maybe. Uh, you know, a couple of neutral camps <laughs> going the way of Elysium does benefit from them, but I'm not sure I would classify it as a loss for Pandemonium they're just losing. yet. Yeah, okay, yeah, they're losing. Elysium, how to make that swift comeback, but take a peek at yeah. the map. It's not Pandemonium doing the Gold Fury Scorpion. It's actually Elysium. Both Scorpions fall at the exact same time. 13 minutes, 50 seconds of this game. Now there's going to be a lot of neutral objectives available. We might see Elysium try and split the map. Maybe they called out that Pandemonium goes to the Fire Giant Scorpion. So wherever the Chaos Team groups, the Order side can go pick up the scraps, be it around Pyro or Gold. And I think that's the, the third option, right, for, for the Scorpion call. It's if there isn't a fight that's just happened and you're not using it as a thing to get after the fight, it's a, okay, they've gone for a Scorpion, we'll go for the other one, and that way there are more options available to us as a game lobby. So I think it's a smart call there from, from Elysium to counter out that Scorpion call with one of their own. It is, and now both neutral objectives spawned on the map. We'll see how they decide to play around it. It is likely going to have to be Pandemonium being the aggressors. They do have the ball in their court. They get to choose where the fights happen, choose which neutral objective really is the POI first. We might see them try and group up around this Pyromancer and play around the lead inside of the soul lane. Just with Stone Cutting Sword and Erendite on Sarpe, they don't even really need Streak Up to confirm a Pyromancer for themselves, but... It's Trix Tank moving aggressively through the chaos side of the jungle, trying to make sure that that Gold Fury stays alive. Just starting to rotate over towards this left-hand side. Here's Connor making his way through the mid laner. That thing might spot him out, and they might just have a little bit of a fight, but Pandemonium now taking that chance to start up the Gold Fury. Trix Tank already falling low. Oh my god, where did his health go? Perez with the Rolling Sun will claim credit for that kill and now elysium tankless will slink back away into the jungle gold fury goes quite handily in favor of pandemonium tough situation there trix tank doing his best to prolong that fight give his team time to rotate in unfortunately though pandemonium was willing to make the commitment sarpe and joshi used their ultimate and immediately shut him down and he's still dead for four more seconds might as well pick up a pyro and potentially a fire giant as well. Never mind. Streak up commits the ultimate to rotating over to the other side of the map. I was almost thinking Pandemonium were feeling themselves that much, but really good. Smart little play then. Just to claim a little bit of extra stuff after the stuff without over committing. Pyromancer is going to be a big boon for them. And honestly, the way that they're going, maybe fire giant isn't that far off anyway. Yeah, they just needed to back up and spend the gold they got from the one team fight as well as the objective. They had 2,000 golden lead going into that gold fury. Afterward, turns into 4,000. But gold in pocket, it does not make for a lead. Now that they've reset, we might see them start to regroup around this fire giant. But Pandemonium, with this draft, they really don't need to force the issue throughout the early. They still have fantastic scaling come late game. Preds with the Scare's Blessing essentially gives his team one extra life. Streak up on this Apollo is going to scale incredibly well. 
especially considering he's gone for the tank buster build kin size before executioner is an interesting allocation of his funds but should at the end of the day result in the exact same thing tricks tank can have a very hard time standing in front of this apollo and i don't think i need to sing the praises too much of what a late game nemesis can do but retribution on his own is going to be enough to turn either terram or tricks tank into a, a squishy glass cannon if you would yeah, no, I completely agree with you there. There's only so much that Shell can protect you from on Kuzumbo when Nemesis is wielding that sort of justice around your head. I don't think... Well, I mean, we don't even have to uh, to try and describe it. Mef, we, we saw exactly what happened to Trix Tank. He evaporated when he tried to walk into the Gold Fury pit, and Terrim could meet the same fate here on the right-hand side, but handily, that horse is here to help. He's going to dash back to that tier 2 tower on the right-hand side. Meanwhile, Pandemonium, they're still looking to keep this pressure up. They want to fell that masonry here on the right lane. And they're going to look to do just that. Blinking forward Jeez. once again is Prez. There's the hug. There's the Divine Judgment down. He falls angry. Looks to ult into uh, the bat. And he's going to turn around for some reason. Why are you staying in that fight? Down falls angry. Gets rest is Sharpe. But Adepting is able to finally find a return kill of his own. Now from the sky comes Streak Jesus. Up. That just coming through. Joshi doing even more than he was before. Streak Up finds Adepting as well. Only man left standing here is Trix Tank. Luckily for him, though, Nemesis doesn't have that ultimate. She's not even on the map right now. However, the Tier 2 Tower shares the fate of its team, and Fire Giant is next. Man, Angry and Spuddy have been asleep at the wheel in Game 3. Both of them nearing the bottom of the damage charts. Both of them falling easily with avoidable deaths. But you know what it is? What really was the clinch pin for Pandemonium there? Take a peek at Joshi's HP bar. My man's only been hit once in the last three minutes, and that's been by Fire Giant. Someone on Elysium has to shut down this Scylla. Man's dashed forward aggressively twice in that engagement. Shouldn't be allowed to do it. He's got so much safety around him though, Mifflin. Preds can be there with the ultimate to save him. Streak up has that huge knock up, but they try and group around Joshi to deal damage to him. There is so much follow up that Pandemonium can put on top of the Scylla to get him out of danger one way or another. So I think Joshi is in nearly th this invincible spot. Their best shot has to be to kill him and then kill him again after he gets revived, but you saw what happened to Sarpe when that happened. Uh, adapting just came through and, and killed him, but it didn't matter because everyone else was already dead. Yeah, just sh shift it though. Just uh, for, for my quality of mind, let's not do it to Sarpe and instead do it to Joshi this time around. And it's not just adapting who has the tools to do it. Angry, if he's able to stealth into the back line, should be able to one shot this Scylla, especially considering he's moving into the Polynomicon tree as well. But it's not as if Anger, Joshi rather, is making it hard. It's not as if he's playing far in the back line around his, his Capri. My man's dashing forward twice in one team fight inside a tower. <laughs> At points was even tanking the tower for his team. Someone's got to stop him. At this point, though, Elysium is so far behind, nearly 9,000 gold with all, pretty much all but the mid-tier 2. Once again, Preds blinking forward, going for that same strategy. Terram trying to do the same thing, but he's going to get evaporated. Look at him, Preds, once again with the kill from the 2. And Sarpe tanking up that Phoenix is not going to matter. He's going to be fine. Blinking forward is adapting, trying to find the same tactic that he did last time, but no kill for Sarpe so far. Trix Tank gets slapped into the ground by the Boomstick, and now Angry looking to alt away in that uh, Sun Wukong form. Through the mid, Phoenix, he goes, but now through the sky comes Streak Up. I think that Elysium might drop the ball here. Pandemonium going straight for the Titan, only three men standing. Meanwhile, the full squad from Pandemonium is here. Down falls the Titan. Elysium starts strong, but can't stick the landing. Crazy, man. I mean... We said it last week, Agro said it multiple times, Elysium is expected to be a nigh-unstoppable team over here in the EU SEC. Mm -hmm. They're stacked up with so much talent, they were able to do it so well last season, they've added adapting to this roster. I mean, these guys look like they should be unstoppable, but time and time again, we've seen these small stumbles in these sets. They've been taking these games to Game 3 pretty consistently, and now, today, Pandemonium put them down just shows the amount of talent we have in this SCC pool over in Europe, where even Elysium do not look untouchable. In fact, 
have been taken down. Ladies and gentlemen, we have more exciting SCC sets to show you today. But for now, we're going to have to drop it back over towards a break as we get set up for set two. Our first set of the day, Pandemonium, coming out on top over Elysium. Can't believe it. And if you guys are like me, sometimes watching and playing Smite just isn't enough. you got to rep Smite in your everyday life. Uh, Smite, excuse me, is paired up with four fans by fans. And we've got pins, pint glasses, clothes, hoodies, all that sort of fun stuff. Uh, all fan-made art, all cool stuff. So make sure to log on uh, to four fans by fans, uh, partnered up with Smite. Grab yourself some Smite swag to carry around with you in everyday life when you have to get up and go out into society every once in a while. Gormizer's with me to break down game number three and the set in general. And Gore, can't believe it. Pandemonium are the ones that come out with the win. Yeah, so, you know, looking at the set, and game number one, Elysium win, but adapting doesn't necessarily get a lot done, right? It's the three pillars. And game number two, adapting doesn't get a lot done, but unfortunately those pillars didn't really come up and instead streak up on the other side that really yep. ends up being the name of the game. And in this game, uh, finally, you get adapting early game. The Kamazots looks good. Nobody else shows up, right? <laughs> like he, he wasn't there for two games, finally comes in. Everybody else seems to have fallen off. It just seems like a, a misalignment, right? The planets just didn't sure. seem to align here for Elysium. They had a really good start to this. Not that first blood, but everything afterward for a little bit. I mean, you can see here they were 3-1. to one. And then it just started to fall away from them. All the praise that we had just given to Apollo. Well, he wasn't able to do it this time around. Chernabog ends up making the big difference here as well. It's just one of those things that or doesn't end up making the big difference here is what I should be saying. It's one of those things that's really, really interesting to see the dynamic, the changes. Elysium making oh these, uh, again, small little micro adjustments, I would say, throughout the yep. set. And then, unfortunately for them, none of it coming to fruition. I started the day off saying I expected them to continue going, you know, 2-0, 3-0, 4-0, and off of that route. But Pandemonium has shown us that we're going to have a lot of competition here in Europe. Yeah, it could get crowded up towards the top of the standings. Gore, I'm glad you bring up a, a little bit of what we saw out of, out of Apollo here in this set and in the Chernabog as well. I, I think now we've kind of established, granted, I think context is important. 
but I think we've maybe established that uh, that Apollo's feeling pretty good in that one-on-one yeah, he one good. up against the Chernabog. Yeah, it, se it seems like he's pretty good there. Like Guan Yu fell by the wayside. Kana on the Sun Wukong. Look at the damage numbers. The only one in this 21-minute game to make his way into that five-digit category of player damage. So, so you want to talk about guys that now have started to drive their team towards success. I mean, we talked about Sarpe before the set started. Streak up as well. Joshi Preds. Kana suddenly becomes one gore, and, and I think he was after last week included, but, but especially after this week, suddenly maybe these teams in the EU SCC need to start considering Sun Wukong bans, Kokulun bans, things like that, because Kana on this pick specifically, Sun Wukong, can take games over. Yeah, it's it's been really interesting. Kana is another one of those players that just kind of dominates it. I mean, we even I yep. think I joked. I said you can't rely entirely on your solo laner just dominating his lane and having that translate to the game. But sometimes I guess that is what you can do. Like if they're doing well enough, they can rotate out. Yes, they can absolutely have a bigger impact on the game and make that big difference. And to the point where not only am I excited to continue watching some of the phenomenal solo laners in the SEC, but I'm excited. You know, we get to next week and we get to see people like Fine OK know, doing man. things like that. Like that juggle of what solo lane is becoming here and what it is for season eight, because we've seen it be kind of the point of contention so far. A lot of people camp over there. If your solo laner does really well, that tends to translate to your team doing really well. Whereas last year it was kind of leave them. And honestly, Every year has been leave them on an island, let them do their thing, and then they'll come into the late game. Like It's interesting to see the dynamic where the right side of the map is kind of popping off a little bit more than the left side. You know, and really just the game in general. I mean, think about EU SEC last year. Nothing wrong with it, but it was slower, more calculated, longer buildup. You get six kills 30 minutes into the game, and you're thinking it's a bloodbath. These games are starting to snowball out of control. I think we had only sub 30-minute games today between yeah. these two teams. So the pace of the game is absolutely picked up as well. With the win today over Elysium, Pandemonium find themselves, for the time being, in the sole possession of first place here in the EU SCC. Just F6, Snake Hunters, Clay Soldiers all looking for that first win, and Clay Soldiers will get a chance to do so here in the next matchup up against the accounting department. Then Just F6 and Snake Hunters battle at the bottom there to get their first win in our third and final set of the day. So Gore, Clay Soldiers, accounting department, that one should be a fun one. You and I are going to not take off our mics. We're going to leave the mics on, but we're going to jump over to a different seat. <laughs> we're going to be casting Clay Soldiers and Accounting Department. Stick around. You don't want to miss it. <laughs> 